This episode of Heavy Cardboard is brought to you from the great folks over at Gamesurplus.com, bringing the world of board games to you. Now, on to the show. Heavy Cardboard Episode 103, Gamma Trade Show and MeepleCon. Coming to you from Vegas, baby, Vegas. <laughs> Welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and today, a whole lot of other related topics in the board gaming hobby. We're your hosts, I'm Edward. And I'm Amanda. So this episode's definitely going to be something a little bit different, a fair mix of behind the scenes stuff of the hobby, running the show, as well as upcoming stuff from a handful of publishers. So if this is something that interests you, like, well, it does me, enjoy. If not, we'll catch you all next week with our next <laughs> review. <laughs> That's right. So I wasn't there, so I'm interested to hear about all of your adventures yeah so this week it was uh it was a, a five-day trip that turned into an unexpected eight-day trip mm -hmm. good good problem to have uh thankfully this is the last trip uh until things ramp up with heavy con mm -hmm. so i kind of had the time and flexibility to be able to go and leave gamma and and travel to meeple con and said yeah why not let's let's experience this plus right. it gave me an expen an excuse to go back to vegas right which you know not terrible plus it was march madness weekend which if you're ever if you're into sports or you're into just the hoopla around vegas being vegas that's one of the best weekends yes of that, the year to go that's the best time to go and so yeah it was it was a cool trip you were definitely missed well thank uh, you you were missed as well so how were things here at the home front? Um, very quiet, full of um, packaging and shipping and printing and attaching labels to packages. And we we set out over 100 packages on the porch for the postman to pick up on Monday. <laughs> Poor guy. Well, luckily, they were all small. Like, all right. they were patron rewards, so most of them were only about two ounces so, but you still, know, still a hundred of anything outside of say rice right. is a lot. Yeah. Of something. So it took me like three or four trips up and down the stairs from the basement to get everything up here. We had, we were using one gigantic bag and then a few little smaller bags and then had boxes and there was just a ton of stuff, but just about everything's out. So if you haven't gotten your stuff, you should have an email from me. And otherwise, enjoy all your swag as it's on its way to you. Oh, cool. Good deal. Finally, out from under that. That's been a long process. Shipping logistics, um, if you guys have played any logistics games like, like we enjoy, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into it. I there have is. a new appreciation for anybody that runs like a Kickstarter type stuff and mm -hmm. they have to deal with the shipping logistics. Yeah. Of that, that is Fulfillment is insane. It's insane. But luckily, this time it was a whole bunch of little things, so it wasn't it wasn't as hard as the last time we had to ship out all of the orders and stuff. At least this was, you know, challenge coins and pins or patches and little things like that. Cool. So. All right. So just about caught up with all that. Yay. Yay. So on my end, travel was smooth. Flew southwest, no issues. Either way, everything was on time, no issue getting my bag checked. It, it, it was so nice. Yeah, it's weird. It's like maybe they should go international or something. <laughs> uh, and our buddy Matt, or as he's so well known since we have 17 Matts in the area, Kleiker, he... Since he is part of the Six Saturdays and a Sunday crew, i.e., um, let's just say he takes care of the home right now in his, his ranch slash farm. Yeah. He was one of the folks that was willing to come on out to Reno with me uh, for Gamma and basically just be an assistant. But he ended up basically being my handler right. while we were there. And it it I learned a lot from him because he, he comes from a white collar background mm -hmm. Uh, from the oil and gas industry and, uh, you know, the executive level type stuff mm -hmm. uh, with that. And I was able he was able to impart a lot of knowledge uh, and the way to 
that I want to carry myself and present the the brand that is Heavy Cardboard, mm -hmm. uh, especially at a industry trade show type thing. And it was absolutely invaluable. Plus, he got a lot of cool B-roll stuff for some of the videos that we're awesome. going to be uploading to YouTube. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, plus, it was it was nice to have a familiar face there. Yeah. Because I mean, there's a lot of familiar faces there with, with publishers and stuff, I would imagine. But it's still nice to have a buddy with you. Yeah, like kind of like a confidant like, right. and, and a sounding board mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, which if anybody is involved at all in any kind of business, that that's invaluable mm -hmm. just to be able to have that real time in person. I mean, it's one thing to be able to call you up or something like that, but you're not there right. for that. So having somebody there was, was really, yeah, truly invaluable. And it, it helps keep things in perspective. Um, but we'll talk more about that here as we go along. I'm definitely excited to think we're going to have like a breakfast sit down meeting with Kleiker and me and you so that he can give me some tips on how to become your handler whenever it's me at conventions instead of him. Because the way that you've raved about how what all he did and everything it just I I'm really excited to sit and take notes and <laughs> see what all I need to do no it, it really was helpful because it's yes this is very much you know a hobby business in a sense that it's a hobby turn business but it's still I'm learning all this stuff I didn't go to business school I didn't go to media school right. I didn't go to you know broadcasting school or any of that so all of this is learning on the fly and anything that helps quicken that learning curve mm -hmm. is beneficial and so yeah it, it, it was an eye-opening experience but all in good ways good so what exactly is gamma so gamma trade show is put on by gamma which is the game manufacturers association which is kind of a nebulous term i guess kind of it helps local game stores not only meet with publishers and distributors as to you know what games they should mm -hmm, be stocking mm -hmm. in their stores, but also how to run better stores. There, there were a plethora Hefe. of different uh, seminars that they could attend. Nice. That everything from social market, you know, social media, mm -hmm. and to how to better run a store in general, as well as how to market themselves better and just the whole it ran the gamut nice. and so it with us being media it gave us a chance to cover it in a sense that we were able to see what all was coming up which i'll be honest as far as heavy cardboard and our listeners and viewers are concerned not a ton there as far yeah. as direct correlation but it was an opportunity to have business meetings with publishers, with distributors, mm -hmm. as well as to kind of get the pulse of local game store owners from around the country. And it was really kind of enlightening to to be able to get that kind of interaction and, and open, honest feedback yeah. on where they think things are going and what they're concerned about mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So from a trade show standpoint it's more directed towards the local game store owners but it also is the only time of the year in which publishers and distributors can meet in a low stress environment in a sense yeah. because you're not having to worry about uh customers i.e mm -hmm. you know the public the gamers out there coming mm -hmm. and, and wanting to buy product and buy right. games from them to where it's everybody there is in the industry and for our standpoint, just being able to network, because this is very much a people-driven business, yep. but also to work out potential deals with publishers and distributors mm -hmm. and possibly local game store yeah. owners around around the country as well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of a all-in-one stop shopping for local game store owners, publishers, distributors, and media to kind of come together in one place in, in an environment that isn't go, 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 yeah. like it is at Gen Con, Essen, it's or not any of these other constant, big shows. Constant demos and constant selling and constant talking and constant, yeah, it wasn't, it's just kind it, of chill and you guys can all just talk together. It was extremely laid back. It was, it was laid back uh, on the level of an Origins, even, I would say, even more laid back than mm. that. Well, speaking of Origins, that's the 
I guess, public one that Gamma puts on as well. It is, a, yeah. right, which I maybe there's a, th- a theme it here. It seems like it. Uh, the Gamma puts on, exactly. So mm-hmm. where ga- the Gamma trade show is for industry only, Origins is basically the equivalent, but for the public, right. for the gaming public, right? Right. Where was Gamma? Well, Gamma this year and for the next two or three years, I believe, is at the Peppermill a hotel, a casino, a resort, whatever, mm-hmm. in Reno, Nevada. And when I when it moved from Bally's in Vegas, um, this was my first trip to Gamma. I was pretty bummed because Vegas is definitely a better location just in right. general, you know, than Reno. Right. However, when I landed uh, and we got to the Pepper Mill, color me impressed. Uh, the Pepper Mill is a proper a resort nice. now having lived in vegas and experienced mm-hmm. all those mega resorts that they have there the pepper mill is definitely smaller than you know bellagio right. the wind stuff like that however it can hold its own it's it's very modern very clean the only downside to the place was it's uh it is a smoking casino mm-hmm. meaning you go through the the casino floor yeah. you definitely can smell the smoke the poker room is gorgeous and non-smoking, which is always nice. Yeah, well, they can't really make the like the slot machine area non-smoking because, I mean, what are, you know, the 90-year-old grandma's going to do? <laughs> they got to smoke. <laughs> there were like nine restaurants in the Pepper Mill. Um, all pretty decent food. Not Some better than others, for sure. But the deli was fantastic. The The buffet was was a top-notch buffet. Awesome. I was, I, I, it was on par with any of the better ones in Vegas. The uh, seafood restaurant, uh, me, Kleiker, and Jess from Artana, mm-hmm. we went there and had all-you-can-eat sushi, which nice. if you're not familiar with Reno slash Vegas, you mm-hmm. would think, hmm, that's in the middle of the desert. Sushi is it wouldn't necessarily be it's, at the top of your list. Sushi is huge, at least in Vegas. Yeah, they they have flights that bring in fresh fish every yep. day, and it's really really top notch. And I gotta say, it was really good there as well. Good. The only real downside, other than the smoking, was mm-hmm. the cost of the food. It's very much it's uh, resort. resort prices, yeah. uh, and that yeah, uh, I mean it's. It's six dollars for a muffin. Yeah. It's you know, it, it, it's definitely you're going to pay for it. Mm-hmm. There were places uh, that you could go that were within walking distance, or even within you know Uber distance, mm-hmm. if you wanted to go out and eat and do that thing. Uh, I, I didn't bother to be honest yeah. with you. I got there on Monday. And the plan was to leave on Saturday. With this being my first gamma, I didn't know how long I should be there, so right. I wanted to be there for the whole thing. You know, like a day before and a day Mm -hmm. after just to cover my bases. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, in the future, I know how long I need to go for. It's much better to scale back than, oh, crap, I really should have been here Tuesday. Right. Big thank you to our sponsor, BoardGameTables.com. If you're in the market for a customized, one-of-a-kind board game table, go check them out, BoardGameTables.com. I mean, like like we've talked about, it de- definitely didn't seem like a like a normal convention, like our listeners would probably be used to, you know, like an Origins or something like that. So, I mean, were there games being played, or were they just demos? Or there were there were games out. There weren't really a whole lot of demoing going on. It was more or less showing the games okay. that that were there. Some uh, you weren't allowed to take any photography oh, or wow. take any video of. Because it's just prototype form, and I'm learning, especially after LyriaCon, mm-hmm. that the reason they don't want you to drop pictures or take pictures of these things is it's not final artwork. And so they don't want to give the wrong impression of their game. Yeah. So that makes sense. It does. But uh, Clay from Capstone Games, he hosted me at the booth mm-hmm. as as he is wont to do. Right. It, ha- it helps him, and it helps us, yep. and it gives us a base of operation. Yeah. So I'm all for it. You can't really, you can't really put like a a pin on just exactly how important that is to be able to have somewhere that you know you can go or that people know they can find you there it's so nice yeah it really is uh it's nice Mm -hmm. it's helpful but he had uh he and his wife ashley they were there running their booth they had wildcatters out they had their upcoming carthago out uh they had a little bit of lignum 
and they had the climbers out, but they weren't really showing, they weren't playing any games or doing it, running any demos. It was just, this is kind of how it looks type thing. Right, right. And if you go around to the various booths, that's kind of how it was. It was more or less show pieces. Type yeah, that's thing. what it sounds like. Like just, hey, this is what it's going to look like whenever it's all set up on someone's table. Exactly. And then there was a lot of marketing material as far as, you know, uh, little flyers that people had for their product for for mm-hmm. the different games and stuff like that. So not a ton of game playing. There was some. Uh, I was able to uh, get a game of Endeavor, Age of Sail, which is the second edition of uh, the one that just, I think it just ended not too long ago on Kickstarter from Mark over at Grand Gamers Guild actually had the prototype of Endeavor, Age of Sail, and he was like, hey, you want to get a game in after our breakfast meeting? I was like, yeah, sure. So the three of us, me, Kleiker, and Mark, sat down, played the game, played the full game. Nice. And that was the first time, I, even though we owned the, the original edition, we hadn't gotten to it nope. yet. And actually, pretty cool little midweight Euro. Uh, nice. Definitely enjoyable. And I dig the changes that they're, they're making okay. to it and also had some suggestions on what to do graphic design wise since some things still weren't quite finished Mm -hmm. other than endeavor the only other game that i played was the mind which is apparently impossible to get a hold of right now but jess from artana had aldi's copy and was showing it to everybody who was willing to sit down and play it and we saw it actually we saw it at lyriacon lyriacon and i got to play it about 400 times (laughs) have yet to win it but definitely had a good time good so but overall I wasn't there to play games. I right. was there for networking and, and, and covering the show, stuff like that. So was that basically the purpose of, of you going to? I mean, you're not a friendly game store owner. You're not a publisher and you're not a distributor. So. Yeah. My whole point was we had one real big meeting set up with a distributor. But while I was there, I uh, met with a whole bunch of different publishers as well as uh, a whole bunch of different distributors mm-hmm. as well as local game store owners to... Well, just work on business side of of things mm-hmm. and put out there that not only the podcast, but also our playthroughs and what it is right. that Heavy Cardboard does and put our name out there in the consciousness uh, more so for, for, you know, to get sponsored playthroughs, stuff like that, as well as uh, potential sponsorship deals down the road, not with publishers, right. but uh, with other avenues. Mm-hmm. Um and basically, that was kind of the main thing was uh, networking at its core is really mm-hmm. what, what the purpose was for just about every media that was there is just networking and, and covering it from different angles. Right. And we just, you know, we were trying to – the main reason that I feel like that was for you to go there was, like you said, to network, but just to be able to bring our listeners and subscribers and stuff just – Hopefully more, you know, more sponsored playthroughs, more more playthroughs of games that nobody's seen yet. And, you know, just different things, exclusives and things like that. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. And I'll be honest, Clay was the reason that I went to this to begin mm-hmm. with, because after Gamma last year, which was his first Gamma trade show, he actually called me and he's like, dude, you have to come to this next year. And I said, OK, why? Mm-hmm. And he says, it's just it's just a really good opportunity to get together um, in a environment in which publishers and distributors and such are not busy trying to make sales to the right. public. They're there to network and to make deals mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And so I was like, OK. I headed out there on Monday morning, not knowing really what to expect, and Kleiker wasn't going to meet me out there until Tuesday night. So I was kind of on my own. First time, you know, having been to Reno since I was 19 and in the Marine Corps. (laughs) Long time ago. Completely different reasons then. (laughs) And so when I got there, I was like, okay, here I am, and we'll see how it goes. And I, I found a familiar face waiting for the shuttle, Berkey. Uh, from Game Toppers as well as uh, his own show. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was cool. So Kevin and I talked. uh, Kevin, Berkey, same thing. Yeah, same person. (laughs) And he and I were kind of just catching up. Hey, how things going? And he was like, yeah, it was nice to see a familiar face as well. Yeah, I bet. You know, learning how to navigate these waters, right? So go get checked into the hotel. And everything's 
really smooth, no problem. So I head down there and go exploring, check out the the hotel and casino, mm-hmm. the whole resort, check out that Gamma has basically a whole wing of this this resort area and all the meeting rooms and all this stuff. So, okay, cool, got that. Fast forward to Monday night, and there was a game night uh, event that was taking place. And what it was was all the sponsors – So all the publishers and distributors that sponsored uh, the Gamma Trade Show had a table in which they had their a few one, two, three, four games out on it. Mm -hmm. And that was where demos were taking place and stuff like that. However, talk about feeling like a fish out of water. Mm. So I'm there to check this stuff out. And I'm like, I just I don't even know how to break the ice here because some of these publishers I've never interacted with before. And I can't exactly go up to them and be like, hey, I'm Edward from Heavy Cardboard. We focus on medium and heavy strategy board games. And here they have like this either game that's, you know, like an RPG or, you know, it's just a total light filler type game. Child's game. Yeah, stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't even know how to break the ice on this. So I felt like such a fish out of water. We did Monopoly. Yeah. um, You know? Yeah. So this this wasn't a really successful evening for me. And so I just felt really, really uncomfortable Mm -hmm. in there. I saw a couple familiar faces. I saw Steph over at Renegade. They had Castell. So I was like, hey, there was one. (laughs) I know what. I saw Bonacore. Uh, from Stronghold, mm-hmm. and but none of his big games were out. It was all light, you know, simple games that they could teach in like two seconds and yeah. type thing. And there was a lot of pizza out there. <laughs> so uh, some of the uh, some of the other publishers that I'm uh, friends with, uh, there was Connor from Inside Up Games and his wife. And they were like, oh, they have pizza and they're letting them play the games. And it was just, it, <laughs> it, it, was, it was pretty funny in that respect. But yeah, I definitely felt out of place that first mm. Monday night, which made me really apprehensive for the rest of the week. But you know what? Tuesday was another day. However, after this, I went down to go play some cards, uh, play poker uh, mm-hmm. for a little bit and try and relax and just, you know, be right. Right. So I'm playing that night, and who do I run into? I ran into who's playing in my in my poker game, but uh, Kevin, uh, one of the uh, one of the head guys at Mercury Games. Oh, well, that worked out well. (laughs) And then there was a couple of local game store owners also at the table, and so I got a chance to talk shop while Mm -hmm, playing mm -hmm. poker. So I kind of I kind of equated it to the type of. Uh, business meetings that take place on the golf course. That's ex- what I was just about to say. If you didn't say golf course, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what it felt like, mm-hmm. and it gave me an opportunity. And you know, here we aren't walking; we're just sitting at the poker right. table talking shop, and being able to ask the local game store owners like, "What is the purpose of them being here?" Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they said was, "It was pretty interesting." how they're over on the East Coast and they could meet up with somebody, say, from San Diego or whatever, and they could be very frank and have very open discussions about numbers, sales numbers, about marketing techniques and all this stuff because they're not they're not in the same market. They're not so infringing that, on each other. Right. They're not they're, there's no competition right. between the two of them. So they could have very open discussions. That's a really cool idea. And yeah. it was a really cool great way for them to be able to network right. and to pick the brain of other local game store yeah, owners. Yeah, yeah. And earlier I had mentioned that all of these owners had to be friendly local game stores. And the reason I say that is the fact that A, they came to this Mm -hmm. because that tells me that they're wanting to improve everything. I mean, obviously they want to make more money. It's a business, right? And so they want to enhance their ability to make more money. But in addition to that, they also want to just be a better game store. Mm-hmm. And that that's a win for everybody up and down the food chain, right? Whether that's that's better for distributors, that's better for publishers, that's better for the game store owners themselves. It's better for us. Yeah. And it's better just for gamers at large because if more people are coming into these 
uh, game stores and they're having better experiences, maybe they become hobbyists. Yeah. And that's more people that we can play exactly. with. Exactly. And it drives demand for more games, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a clear win across the board. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I saw so many local game store owners there that were really trying to enhance the experience for customers at their store, I think that was the single biggest takeaway that I took from Gamma, that there are a lot more friendly local game store owners that are working to improve mm -hmm. everything about their business, um, as well as the, the, the way they're able to present to the customers in general and make it a more welcoming environment. Yeah, it, it was awesome to see. It was really, really good. Yeah. In fact, it was very. I, I was very pleased to see uh, Gary Sproul, who runs. It's not really a local store for us, but it's, it's kind local ish. Of, right. He's about an hour north of us, the Haunted Game Cafe mm -hmm. uh, up in Fort Collins. It, awesome store I, to I begin kinda, with. I kind of do consider that to be my local game store because, I mean, that's really the only one we go to. Yeah, that, that's the only one we ever frequent. We mm -hmm. go up there a few times a year mm -hmm. uh, to try and help, you know, whether it's for extra life, extra life or just in general. Um, definitely one that we we definitely like supporting. So it was really cool to see Gary yeah. there. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would expect nothing short of that because let's face it, it's a pretty awesome game store to begin with. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever in Fort Collins, check out the Haunted Game Cafe. And then go around the corner and have some delicious food. Yes. at Young's? Young's. Oh my oh, yeah. gosh, it's so good. Good, good Vietnamese food. Mm -hmm. So that brings us kind of to Tuesday. Kleiker showed up. I, I literally had nothing to do on Tuesday. I realized that there was no kind of meet and greet. There was just nothing going on on Tuesday mm. for me. It was all seminars for the local game stores. Oh, okay. And then I was like, then what did I do? That, so I, I, all I really, I, I networked a little bit, mm -hmm. but mostly play cards on Tuesday. I, I'll be honest. Tough life. It, well. When in Rome, I, I know. I just wanted to be somewhere centrally located for when <laughs> Kleiker showed up from the airport, he knew where to meet me. Well, that, I mean, that's tongue in cheek, but also number two, that the night before proved that you're going to be able to network probably at the poker table too. So. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was doing. So Tuesday really was much ado about nothing. Uh, there's really nothing about it, but I still was kind of uh, really not sure about things. Going into Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday were the two main days for Gamma because mm -hmm. those were the two days that the actual trade show itself, the trade floor, was open. So all the booths and, you know, if you imagine a game convention and you have the exhibit hall, that's exactly that's what, what, it is, what yeah. I'm talking about. So Wednesdays and Thursdays, or Wednesday and Thursday, those were the only two days it was open. It was only open uh, from 1 p.m to 6 p.m. It was only open five, wow. five hours, which is really nice. That way you're not, you know, there for 10 hours not and absolutely. exhausted yeah. and the whole nine yards. So I go in there early. Kleiker set up the camera to kind of, you know, watch the, the game store owners come in through, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. So the game store owners were like the gamers at a normal convention, right. lining up, get, <laughs> waiting to come in That's and neat. all that. So he got film of that. And I actually was at the Capstone Games booth because I was like, I really don't know what to do. I don't know. I, and I was talking to Clay about how just out of place I felt the last mm -hmm. two days. He said, dude, just wait. He said, this is an environment you're used to and everybody yeah. and their mother is here. This and that. And he, I said, all right, we'll see. So we had some trifold flyers, pamphlets uh, mm -hmm. made up that uh, kind of highlight the, the video side of things because – if we're going to get any kind of sponsor playthrough, it's a playthrough because we don't allow publishers to sponsor the podcast, right. which we've covered all this in the past about we're not allowed. We don't accept money uh, for our reviews. So marketing the podcast doesn't make a whole lot of sense right. in that environment. So I was there basically just to push the – not push, but just to highlight yeah. the video side of things. So I went around and met with tons of publishers, tons of distributors, and everything in between. And I got to say that it could not have been a more successful two days. Awesome. Actually, Wednesday was the really big day is when I had most of the meetings scheduled and 
Uh, yeah, it was a fist pump type day. Hmm. Now it's stuff that we don't want to really talk about yet. We'll 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 talk about the details of all this stuff later mm-hmm. on. But yeah, it was a really really good day all, all the way around. And come to find out, uh, a lot more publishers knew about what we are and who we are uh, than I expected. Nice. So that was that was always a, a, a welcome treat. Uh, to hear that, oh no, no, I'm, I I watch your show and oh, I'm like, oh, oh, well, that's awesome. <laughs> like, or yes. I li- or I listen to your podcast and I'm like, okay, cool, that's good, all right, so awesome. But then I was able to kind of hand out the pamphlets and and tell them, look, this is kind of what it is that we offer mm-hmm. and what we do, what we do. And if you've watched any of our playthroughs, you guys already know all this stuff. Yes, but it's not everybody does, and so it was just that type of stuff Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so Kleiker was walking around and getting video think of it as b-roll you know like uh, background stuff Mm -hmm. right filler uh, video stuff and he was doing awesome with all of that and then there were a bunch of interactions and he actually was walking around a lot with me and I was introducing him to to various Mm -hmm. folks whether it's media whether it's publishers distributors whatever and him having come from a white collar business background, it was really interesting to be able to hear his feedback on both how I'm carrying myself as well as the interactions and what to think and and, and as far as just big picture stuff. And, you know, I tried to dress nice. I was in a polo shirt, you know, the heavy cardboard polos and, you know, khakis and a whole mm-hmm. yards. Just wanted to present myself in a in a very professional business like manner and yep. i feel like we we did that and Kleiker was like i said earlier just invaluable for immediate feedback on things oh which is you know, very th- important this would be a better way to approach yep. that or this would be a better way to describe this mm-hmm. or hey no that was that was solid mm-hmm. and it's just to be able to pick his brain so that was that was just cool right for yes. you know this is a little behind the scenes on you know, I'm learning all this stuff as I go. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. So that was basically Wednesday and Thursday Mm -hmm. was on the trade show floor, you know, walking around and it was it it was pretty sizable. I mean, it wasn't Gen Con size or anything, but it was definitely origin size as far as all the booths. So that was that was really productive and really helpful for, uh, for the show and just for me personally, just to be able to learn these interactions in a better way and yes. just go about doing that. So that was really good. After those, then it was just, there wasn't a whole lot of gaming. And by a whole lot, I mean there was very, very, very little gaming actually taking place even after the trade show floor closed. On Thursday night, there was the PSI game night where people could just come in and play games, that type of thing. I skipped that one, I'll be honest. But PSI is kind of a unique animal within the business that they have a couple of hundred publishers that basically they are the go-between between Mm. publishers and distributors and they help get their games into Barnes and Noble and like Target and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and all that. So they hosted that on Thursday night. I was back at the poker table because in the evenings I found that was actually the best place to network for me. And wouldn't you know, sitting to my direct left was the chief operating officer of PSI. (laughs) So got to talk to him and on both sides of me uh, of where he was sitting and where I was sitting was local game store owners. So got to kind of bounce ideas from them. And we got to talking about everything from where do you see the hobby going and your concerns about stuff like Asmo Day and this and that. And it seemed that everybody was really excited for the most part, about the future of the hobby, the the one big concern that it seemed that s- seemed to percolate throughout all the local game store owners in which we we discussed this was the fear of the conglomerates, whether that's Asmo Day or whatever, taking over distribution channels. Because if they were to do that, then that puts a serious bottleneck on companies being able to get their games into distribution yeah. it's not so much as Day taking over publishers it's more or less putting a control more or less controlling the distribution channels and that seems to be the big concern and the big fear yeah it sounds it sounds very scary 
um, potentially, but yeah. nobody knows how things play out. Right. Uh, but we'll we'll see how that goes. But overall. Uh, local game store owners that I talk to seem to have a really good time as far as uh, the seminars and, and learning to run their awesome. stores better by the end of that. So here it is Thursday night and essentially the con's over. Mm-hmm. It. Most everybody goes home on Friday, I found out, that they said, yeah, it was it was overwhelmingly successful. Good. In the evening, there was a catered dinner and there were presentations and there was uh, kind of press release stuff. And I was, I had my eyes opened at how just slack jawed a lot of people were at, oh, look at the minis for the latest games, workshop mm-hmm. games, or, you know, similar type stuff. And just people were like, oh, yeah. and I was like, I, I, I really, it, it was an eye opening experience that I realized minis sell, but just to watch these local game store owners get so enthralled by this because again it's what sells it sells right so that said there were plenty of board games and and without minis uh, Mm -hmm. on display and that were getting hyped there so that was uh that was pretty cool good even if there wasn't a whole lot of our niche being highlighted there there was a capstone with wildcatters Mm -hmm. and and stuff like that and as you guys are going to hear the estates, i.e. Noya Heimat 2.0 coming from Capstone. So as you guys are going to hear here in a little bit, I was fortunate enough to, on the last day, sit down with some various publishers to talk about upcoming games or games that are already out that may pique the interest of, you know, y'all. So I have Clay from Capstone Games, and he and I spoke strictly about the estates or Mm -hmm. Noya Heimat 2.0. Then I had... Connor McGoey from Inside Up. He has the uh, the survival game, uh, Summit. He doesn't want it called a mountaineering game. <laughs> I had Philip from Board and Dice and uh, a solo campaign that they're coming out with called Blake Chronicles. I had Kevin from Mercury Games, and he and I were sitting and talking uh, 100% about the 10th anniversary edition of Container. Mm-hmm. And lastly, I talked to Jess Davis from Artana Games, Mm -hmm. and she was highlighting uh, the Genius expansion for Einstein, which Mm -hmm. Einstein by itself, probably not a game that would really be in our scope, I think is a good way to put it, uh, and really wouldn't interest any of y'all out there. But with the Genius edition or Genius expansion, which is just some cards, Mm -hmm. really steps the game up and definitely is a lot more interesting now and they also have a dice drafting game which y'all know me i'm all for dice oh drafting. yes so you guys will be able to listen to those here momentarily that's right so like you said at the beginning the original plan was for you to stay at gamma until saturday morning and then come home right but yeah on thursday jess steph and a few other folks were like hey you don't have anything going on this weekend, do you? And I was like, uh, no, I'm flying home on Saturday. They said, why don't you change your flight and come to Vegas? And I was like, uh, why? And they said, MeepleCon is going on this weekend in Vegas. And I was like, let me see how much that'll cost. So did some finagling, called you, called, called you right. and asked what you thought about it. And you were like, yeah, go for it. Well, okay, done. So instead of leaving on Saturday, I just uh, changed my flight to where I flew out Friday morning and that was that was definitely in doubt because there was a blizzard that was moving in to Reno. I did not expect a blizzard in <laughs> Reno, I'll be honest. They don't get a ton of snow in Reno. They do in Tahoe, which is right nearby, but right. not so much in Reno. But thankfully it was uneventful and we were able to fly out no problem, landed and headed uh now that I'm in Vegas, headed over to the East Side Cannery which is a very much a locals casino on the east side of town and uh the which is where MeepleCon was mm-hmm. was going to take place. So this one definitely seems a bit more like something that our listeners would be familiar with. Oh, for sure. And this was a gamers con in mm-hmm. a sense that it's open gaming for 3 whole days and there was a very small little exhibitor area mm-hmm. and then it was just one big exi- uh, one big hall for open gaming nice. and that was that so if you've ever been to bgg con 
LyriaCon, uh, kind of the gaming area at Origins. It was kind of like that yeah. to where it's just you go in. They had a small little library, but it, I say small, but it was it was pretty well stocked. Nice. And people just showing up and, and gaming. Cool. And that was pretty cool. I saw, let's see, Eagle Griffin had a booth there. Mayday had a booth. Uh, Yellow had a booth. And then there, uh, Blue Panther, which is the... Uh, the print-on-demand oh, folks yeah. that uh, that Hollenspiel uses, they had a booth there, and then there were a couple other smaller ones as well, and that was it. So it was totally the booths were the secondary thing to the actual gaming mm. that that was going on. So uh, bought a pass, and and we had we had free range nice. of the of the of the place for three days. Uh, Tom Vassell and uh, Z and Sam they were there for. Dice Tower and let's see who else. Uh, Steph uh, and Jess. So there, it's funny they're there for themselves for open mm-hmm. gaming. They weren't there for Renegade and Artana <laughs> respectively. They were just there. They to, were just board gamers. Yeah, they were just gamers there. Uh, I ran into Ambi and Crystal from Board mm-hmm. Game Blitz. Meeple Overboard was there, and there were a few others that I'm probably forgetting. Our but friend John that moved back to Vegas. Yes, and it was funny. Like I saw John, and it never occurred to me to reach out Mm-mm. to John to be like, "Hey, man, I'm coming nope. into town." <laughs> so my bad, John. Sorry. But when I saw him, I was like, "Dude!" And he's like, "What are you doing here?" It's <laughs> like I'm here to play games, and that's exactly what we did. It's kind of going to become a running joke at this point, I think. But since it seems to be your duty to teach Kalis to to a group of people that have never played it before at every convention you go to. How'd this one go? Yeah, that was that was not intentional. So <laughs> at LyriaCon, I taught it to Adrian, Bruno, and Paulo. And then here, I taught it to Steph, who this woman plays more games than you, me, and our entire game group combined. Yeah. She's never played Kalis. Toby and Amby. Never played Kayla. So, yeah, that, that went pretty well for the most part. I say for the most part because Steph felt like it was nails on a chalkboard. Did not enjoy ah. it at all. And Amby and Toby didn't hate it. So, that's a win. Yeah. Um, I, I hashtag good teacher. Oh, big time really good that. teacher, I, huh? Yeah, I did not do well. But <laughs> had a lot of fun teaching them that. And then, uh, yeah, then played a whole lot uh, more of The Mind. And both Toby and Amby uh, really enjoyed that night. It was so much fun. because if So the mind, let me give a little context here. So what it is, is a card game. And you play kind of, if you've ever played a game like Wizard, to where it's a... Uh, like incremental. Yeah, to where, you know, the first round you get one card. Second round you get two cards, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And the cards range from number one to 100. And they just have a number on them. And you have a certain amount of lives. So we played a four-player game. I think we had four lives. And what it is, is you have to play this, uh, the cards, in ascending order without any communication whatsoever Mm. between the players. So everybody gets dealt one card, and they range somewhere in the neighborhood of 1 to 100. And you had to play them all in the right order. So in the second round, everybody has two cards, so on and so forth. And it's just... Even without communication, there are ways to communicate without yeah. communication, right? Or without verbal communication anyways. And it becomes a a really, really clever mind trick of a game and was really, really well done. I am super stoked to get a copy of this game. And nice. Yeah, looking forward to it. I know, I think it's Pandasaurus uh, has announced that they're going to be publishing it okay. here in the States. So looking forward to getting a copy of that. It sounds like something that's going to be out at conventions and everywhere. Everywhere. Yes. and it, It's going to be kind of the new hotness for, yeah. you know, filler or starting a game yeah. day or ending a game and day. That's what that's I, like we used to something we would play right before, you know, when we were waiting for people yep. and stuff like that's that. That's exactly it. So that that saw the table early and often. We all know how everybody, you know, really feels about dice games, but... I heard that you and a few people played a cooperative dice game that you really enjoyed. Yeah, so I have liked this cooperative dice game a <laughs> lot for, for many years. Uh, I'm not very good at it, um, and I definitely consider myself the human cooler when it comes to this one. <laughs> but after we got done playing a couple of games of The Mind, 
uh, Toby was like, hey, anybody want to go shoot some craps? Uh, and yes, the answer was yes, <laughs> unanimously around the table. So me, Ambie, Toby, and Steph headed down to the craps table. And it's kind of nice. One nice thing about the local casinos is the limits are much lower mm-hmm. and the odds are much higher, yep. which are is a good thing. So it had $5 crap table and uh, had up to 10 times odds, which on the strip... You're lucky to get anything more than three, four, or five times yeah. odds on those. And usually on the strip, it's going to be a $25 minimum bet type stuff. And so uh, we went down there and ended up with a couple of hot shooters, turned 100 bucks into just over 300 So that was nice. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. So uh, it was funny. I was giving uh, Tom Vassell a really hard time because he was playing Zolkin, and I was like, "Are you okay? Like, do, you, <laughs> do you do you need a hand?" No, you guys will hear. Actually, Tom and I sat down and talked shop a little bit here, and he and I get along really well, uh, oh, even yeah. though we have very divergent ways of going about covering the hobby. Just fine. You're still two people, and you still like each other. Yeah, so. we get along great. And so I was giving him a hard time about him playing Zolkin, and I said, "Yeah, we're going to go play a cooperative dice." Uh, game and he was like really I said yeah we're gonna go shoot dice and he's like oh (laughs) so yeah yeah that was that was definitely a good time and also speaking of interviews I was fortunate enough to speak to Tim who is the one of the two founding members of MeepleCon. Nice. And he also runs uh, a friendly local game store there in Vegas, which I didn't get a chance to visit this trip, mm-hmm. but definitely going to make a point nice. to go by there next year. Uh, well, yeah, enough about that. Why don't you guys hear? Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Sunday here at MeepleCon 2018 in Las Vegas. Happy to be joined by Tim Mativier. Yes. Uh, the, I guess, founder of MeepleCon. Is right. It, is myself, that right? Myself and Dave, yep. All right. Very cool. So uh-huh. fourth year of the convention? This is, yes. All right. So how did this come to be? Uh, well, Dave and I uh, met as friends like on Board Game Geek online. As uh, you do. Yeah, over a game of uh, Twilight Struggle. Yes, and we, so we played Twilight Struggle uh, probably two, three times, and then a little convention came up in um, uh, Bryce, uh, BryceCon okay, in I've Bryce Canyon, Utah, yeah, 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 about four hours away from here, so we decided to go together, and on the way up, I was like, man, how come Vegas doesn't have a board game convention, and then we went there, and we saw how easy and small it was, and I'm like, we could do this, so we uh, drove back on a Monday, Tuesday, I went and went, rented a room, and uh, a month and a half later, uh, first MeepleCon came about. You know, I can appreciate that very, very much because very similar to mine, uh-huh. uh, we run a, a convention called HeavyCon. It's a small 150 person convention or so. And I was like, yeah, we can do this. But man, the day after yep. it, it got started, you, you, you don't, you, you don't, uh, you don't wait. No, <laughs> not at all. Because I, I, I was like this, you know, and, and the thing about it is, is we went into it knowing, hey, we're going to invest X amount of dollars and we're planning on losing it because right. we're yes. just going in for the investment. We're actually, so we under promised and over delivered. That was our mantra because, you know, we, we were telling publishers like to, you know, submit games. We were like, we're hoping for a hundred people. We never over inflated numbers, never over promised. And we just really spent a lot of time and it worked out well. And then uh, our second year, we jumped up to three days. The first year was just one. Second year, we came here to jump up to three days. And here being the East Side Cannery. The East Side Cannery. Okay. Yes. Uh-huh. All right. So yep. it's been here for the last three years? It has been, yes. Okay. All yes. right. And it's just steadily grown from there? It has. It has. And it's good because, you know, um, I also uh, work for Yellow, too. Um, so I go to all the conventions and I know a lot of the people and stuff. So I'd asked Tom um, if he could just come over because, you know, that's when Gamma was still in Vegas. And of course they were there. It's like, hey, could you guys come over? And Rado happened to come to that first one we had here, too. He happened to be in from Malta. You know, so we just asked him to come over and they did. And they just liked the feel, how it was mellow, just people playing games. And, uh, you know, and then Tom has been great. He's been with us every year since. So this is his third year with us, you know, and Sam and Z and the guys from the Dice Tower. So yeah, it's been good. Uh, so it's my first year. And uh, a few of the folks, whether it's Steph, Jess, and, and Amby and Toby mm-hmm. and some other folks said, hey, you know, you're in Gamma. Why don't you come down here? and uh, come check it out. And so I was like, you know what? I'll change my flight. Let's let's come on down. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Really yeah, appreciate absolutely. that. No, yeah. and this is, this is kind of an ideal game playing convention because uh-huh. it's super, it's not pretentious at all. 
number one. Number two, it doesn't have, it's super low stress. It's, it's about as laid back as a convention could be. And uh -huh. I mean that in the best way possible to where you guys have a pretty decent sized library here. You have tons of open gaming. There's a little bit of vendors over here on the side, but I would say 99.4% of this is just people getting together. Hey, you want to play a game? Yeah, all right, what do you want to play? I don't know, let's go figure something out. And that's what it is yes. for the entire weekend. Absolutely. And if, if you're ever in the, the Vegas area around the, and is it always this right with, does it always correspond to uh, Gamma Trade Show? Um, yeah, it might be might be before next year we might move, but it's going to be yeah around the same time. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, like you said, and thank you for noticing that because that's what we really want. We just want uh, people to really uh, be together as a community, you know, because we're all brethren and oh, <laughs> this nerd sure. hobby. Re it's regardless like... <laughs> of what type of game you play, whether yeah, absolutely. whether it's Axis and Allies, whether it's Bunny Bunny, you know, Moose Moose or whatever, or whether it's whether it's Twilight Struggle uh -huh. or whether it's, you know, some of the, the heavier war games or 18XX. We even busted out Rolling Stock, uh -huh. uh, a, a heavy economic game here uh, the other day. So it doesn't matter what you're into. There's going to be like-minded people. Absolutely. You know? And the fact that every single person that I've encountered has been super laid back. It's been everybody has a smile on their face. And here it is Sunday afternoon and, you know, place is still hopping it know? is so it's good is... because it's good because it, it does when you get too large i think you lose like you know people knowing each other by names yes and the friendly faces because people have been here now with us one two three or four years you know and you remember the same people you see like dan over there at r and r he's fantastic he knows people because he's been this is his third year with us now too i think and he remembers people from last year and the year before so it's a nice community and it, it feels really good and on that note there's something to be said, I mean, about the just spectacle of Essen and Gen Con and, and mm -hmm. those type of conventions. Absolutely. Yes. But if I'm not working for the show, uh -huh. this is the type of convention that I would want to attend because this is, it's intimate. And yes. it has that family feel. And I don't mean necessarily like family friendly. It is that. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by just, it's a community feeling yes. of it to where, you know what? We're all a bunch of geeks that enjoy this this crazy hobby of ours. And you know what? There's this common ground no matter what walk of life you're from, Absolutely. whatever you do for a living. You know what? We can we can sit around and enjoy each other's company and share that around a shared interest. And that's the that's one of the biggest things that I love about this hobby. And and I think you I really do think you've nailed it really well here. Well, thank you. And we'd like you to come back. So, and, and again, as it's been great meeting you. It was the first time I have to meet you. And thank you so much for coming on here. I mean, I, I really appreciate it. And we'd like you to come back and be a part of this with us. So you come back as our guest next year Absolutely. and for, the, for years to come. Yeah, but, I, yeah I, because, and, and see, another good thing what we really want is because, um, you know, with people like Tom, you know, with the Dice Tower and you and like Rod and all these people, a lot of us, you know, gamers, us geeks, don't have a chance to meet the people we may listen to. You know what I mean? On the podcast. Sure, sure. Or you may see on the video cast review shows, right? But it's so good, like, people sitting down and playing a game with you. Yeah. Right? And they're yeah. like, hey, I listen to this guy yeah, <laughs> on the podcast, you, and now know, I get to sit down and play a game and with keep him. keep in mind, you know? we weren't all, I mean, whether it's Tom, whether it's myself, whatever, mm -hmm. we're gamers first. First and foremost, yes. I mean, we're just, we're just people. We just happen to be behind the mic or behind the camera or whatever. Right. And ultimately, hey. Are you cool? Yeah, let's yeah, play a game. Exactly. You know what I mean? And the thing so. about it, it what, what's so nice about it is, um, and, and I tell Tom, Sam, and Zia all this all the time, is it, it's amazing how much it means to people. And that's what makes me feel so good because, like, it, it, and they're, they're fantastic. And I'm sure you would be too. I'm sure you are too. That, that like, people are amazed at, wow, I'm playing with this per you know no they're normal people they like you said we're gamers at heart first and foremost we're gamers 100%. so we just want to sit down and play a game with you enjoy your company and yeah that's what we're going for and yeah we're really happy i yeah, really I, yeah i i mean a it's vegas so there's that right, right. so for after hours activities uh -huh. whether it's shooting dice whether it's playing cards or eating the most amazing cheesecake, which is at the Luxor <laughs> Cafe, which you wouldn't think, but uh -huh. I used to live in Vegas. Oh, did you so, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I lived here for about three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's it, it's a good excuse to come back. There you and go. And to visit, but also to just extend the, the hobby. Yes. Uh, and I think it's awesome that 
Vegas, which is no small town. I mean, that is true. There, yep. there's a lot more to it than just the strip yep. and, and all of that. And from the looks of things, a very vibrant uh, gaming community. So it's really awesome to see. It really yeah, is. there really is. And I'm so glad. Thank you for saying that because, you know, I've been here since 2006. So okay. this, this is my home now. And uh, yeah, uh, the, the majority of the world thinks that three mile strip of insanity is all there is. is all Vegas, there is. It's all desert all yes. the way around. And they don't realize that we are a normal city. We have people who love board games. We have arts and culture. We have one. Yes. So yes. Thank you for saying that. It, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's true because we used to have to combat it whenever our friends would be like, "Woo, Vegas!" And yeah. I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I'll go down to the strip. That's fine." But now okay. coming back as a, a quote unquote tourist, uh -huh. it's nice to go back to stomping grounds and stuff like that, and you know, like oh, your hair on fire a little bit here in there, but at the same time to be able to enjoy the, the hobby, you know, I mean, cause the gaming is until midnight every night. Yes. Thereabouts, yeah. right? mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's three full days and yeah, uh, definitely a big fan. So not to be remiss, but also you do happen to run a, well, I assume it's an F L G S and not just an L G S yep. uh -huh. having met you here now. And uh -huh. you're, I, I dig your personality. I oh, feel like thank it's you. infectious. It's, it's it's warm, it's welcoming, and I think uh, I think that's going to be good for uh, your local game store. So tell folks a little bit about it. Yeah, so I uh, own a Meepleville Board Game Cafe. I was the first board game cafe in the entire state of Nevada, not oh, only cool. not only just okay. the city of Las Vegas, okay. but uh, when Snakes and Lattes opened in 2010, okay. I was like, this this is what I want to do. I so I've been studying, practicing. Uh, getting games, researching, visiting, all this kind of stuff, and I just had to do it and open it. And um, yeah, it's been a success. And again, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, I love the fact when tourists, people from out of town, because if you're a gamer, no matter where you go, what are you going to do? Have, you're, have you're gonna, games will travel, You're right? going to look up a board game place or something, and they do, and it's so, and it makes me feel so good that they're able to leave that three mile strip of insanity and come and see what real people in Vegas do. And so, I try to do, create the same atmosphere at Meepleville. Hey, listen, this is for you. This is a nice board game fate. Yeah, this is what locals do. We have a nice game cafe. Have over 2,000 games in the library Impressive. to play. Yep, my retail section has uh, over six, 700 titles. We offer beer, wine, uh, pizza, smoothies, nachos. We have seating for over 100 people. And uh, most nights are open till midnight, so. Sign me up. Yeah. For sure. Now, next year when I come back, I will make a point to stop by there. Oh, and, please do. I'd love to have you come by. Stuff. I think that would be awesome. So yeah. where, where in relation to the city is it? Like what? So uh, if you look at like a map of the valley, we are dead center. Uh, it's at Sahara and Decatur, which is a real, real busy intersection. Kind right of in a town. centrally located overall. It really is. It really yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right, right in the center of the valley. So it has easy access from the right here. I mean, since you lived here, you know, pretty much everything's about 30 minutes away. Right. You know, in Vegas. Um, so yeah, it's good. And it's close enough to the strip where, like I said, a lot of tourists can come up and visit us there as well. Very cool. So that's Meepleville here in Vegas. Meepleville, yes. And Meepleville actually came after MeepleCon. So so we had started MeepleCon first, yeah, and then opened really? Meeple. Really? I, opened so Meeple I, I would have assumed it would have been the opposite. That I know, it, a lot of people do, yeah. Very cool. So you know what? Can't get enough. You know what? I'm just going to open a cafe. <laughs> Much like me, I don't know how to do things halfway, and uh -huh. apparently you don't either, Tim. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, just, it's just such a, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful hobby. Um, I have a really good friend of mine. I'm not going to mention his name, but I know he'll appreciate this story. Uh, he's a doctor like a surgeon. And uh, he told me the story about, you know, uh, when his wife and I were kind of dating and getting together, where um, she couldn't get it. Like, you know, a lot of people, you know, who, oh, oh, like- Oh, yeah. Oh, you... when I tell people, what do you do for a living? <laughs> yeah, I review board games for a living. They're like, yeah. like Risk and Monopoly. I know. Yes, exactly like So she that. didn't yeah. get it. She's like, why do, you, why do you need like 100 games? How come some of them haven't even been opened? Like, <laughs> she didn't understand. And so it was almost maybe causing a little bit of friction or whatever. But, and he kind of, he sat down, sat her down one time and he said to her, he goes, look, I'm a doctor. I make a lot of money. I could have a lot worse hobbies. Absolutely. Like I could, you know, have planes or do a lot. It's board games. And she was like, yeah, I guess you're kind of right. It's not that bad. I mean, it's. I mean, yeah, there are definitely worse vices than yes. board games. Let's put it that way. Especially, <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Especially here in Vegas. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just cool that this hopefully will be able to open some eyes 
to folks to let them know, like like what you said, it's not all about the Strip here in Vegas. Yeah. There are normal people. It's just the city that happens to have the Strip right down the road. Correct. You that know? That's all we are. We are a normal city with a three-mile Strip of Insanity running through the middle of it. That's yep. it. You take that out, and we're just like any other city. So good stuff. So MeepleCon 2018 just about in the books. I appreciate yep. you having me down. Looking forward to uh, adding it to the schedule for next year. That Tim. would be fantastic. We'd love to have you here. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Tim. Yes, thank you. So yeah, Tim, pretty down to earth dude. Just, uh, I mean, we're all just geeks, right? That's Who right. just share a love for this hobby. So that was that was cool for him to take a few minutes uh, to be able to sit down and talk with me. So thanks for that, Tim. All right, first up, we have Clay from Capstone Games. He and I sit down and talk the Estates or Neue Heimat 2.0. Hey y'all, Edward here from Gamma 2018. Happy to be joined by good friend and publisher, Clay Ross from Capstone Games. Thanks, Clay. How are we doing, man? Doing well. You? Doing great. How's the, I, uh, how's the I, I say con, but it's a trade it show. It's trade an show. event. So how's it been going for y'all? This has been phenomenal. We're at the Pepper Mill in Reno, and uh, last year was at Bally's in Vegas, and it just felt kind of empty there, um, and then this year it's just it's packed. It's, oh, it's, it's I have no frame of reference, but yeah. it's it's it feels like Origins as far exactly as size what I was gonna wise. Say. Yeah, right? there's so much foot traffic out there, and just a lot of good conversation. It's nice to get retailers and distributors, and obviously the publishers out there all under one umbrella to network together. This is the event that everybody in the industry kind of comes together and just reconnects after a full year because there's not really one event like this that happens. And so. last year, <laughs> afterwards, you were like, dude, you have got to come to yes. this. And I was like, really, you think so? And yes, he was He was 100% <laughs> correct. Because like you said, it's the only time of the entire year in which you get retailers, publishers, distributors, media, and not everyone pushing product to the consumer. And so it's a chance to get everybody in a relatively casual environment in which to well make deals and and so on yeah, and so forth just, right it's networking like you said and, and and there are tons of deals that are made and it's 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 exciting it's, yeah it's it, just a it's a start to the year it's the start of the board game season and yeah, it's exciting i mean yeah it, re it really is and i think start of the board game season even though here we are mid-march that's exactly it ahead of you know con season beginning whether yes. you know starting with heavy con and going from there from there to all the way well now pax unplugged right yeah so we've got all those shows coming up and some people are showcasing hey this is what's coming out at essen we haven't really covered that yet um so we're more focused on what's coming out sooner than later so so speaking of which we have the estates or as all of our viewers and listeners will know it as, Neue Heimat. Correct. So, so this is the second edition of Neue Heimat known as The Estates, right? Yeah, this is The Estates. Um, we, uh, it's Neue Heimat in uh, the North American market would not do well, I'm afraid to say, <laughs> as much as everybody likes the... Because names matter, right? It does, and you got to think of it from a, 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 a total market view of... of of somebody that doesn't know anything about capstone games or is new to the market, they're going to be very intimidated by new year, new year, how do you, I don't know how to say that. Right. And how, Hyman, so so how, like, can, how can you yeah. sell something that you can't even pronounce, right? Yeah, it's very difficult. So uh, we wanted to make it more friendly, more approachable, just like in the Simply Complex line is trying to do. And uh, it's a great fit, and I'm really excited with how this project is progressing. So you said friendly. This is not a friendly game. Approachable. Sorry, maybe. Gotcha. I should okay. Use that okay. Word. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. So approachable from yeah. a just retailer being able to sell to the public. Exactly type thing? that, okay. and just more accessible to a, a, a wider age age range. I know the name doesn't really have an effect on that, but just doing that to cater to the simply complex line is what we're really focusing on. In the same vein as as the climbers did last year, so. Uh, we're going to continue that with the estate. So, okay, so obviously you it's still in development as far as graphic design and artwork and all of those things, so we don't have that to show. We have some assets that you're working on yeah. that we can show, 
But as far <clears throat> as the gameplay, it, is anything changing as far as that goes? Uh, there's not, uh, no, the, the rules are the same. There's, okay, so with the estates and the way Heim, it, there are variants that people, some groups play, like we were just talking about earlier. Right, as far as you could either play with the faces up to where you can't see it, faces mm -hmm. to the side to where it's always visible, stuff like that, right? right? So we're gonna be very clear in all, our rule set that, um, when you place a floor cube that you can look at all the building or all the cubes underneath it. So there's essentially no hidden information on that. Uh, and another one is uh, your money in this game. Um, you just can't put it underneath the table. You can have a stack of it. So somebody can just kind of guesstimate on what value, you don't have to reveal that. So to them. nobody can ask you to count your stack or they can ask, but you don't have to do so. They yes. can just kind of eyeball how much money you have exactly. to be able to gauge their bids. And the same thing that. with when you do your illegal earnings underneath the game board. That's going to be the same deal as well. Okay. All right. So, but rules wise, pretty much the same, except another thing you guys are taking out all the blank rubes correct? yeah that's correct that is a rule that i just i cannot stand in this game and it's i talked with klaus uh the designer klaus zock and he is like i don't know why we put that in there we need to get it out and i was like hey we are on the same page with this one Let's <laughs> awesome that that makes so, that really easy because yeah. that essentially here even though it's an approachable game yeah. it is a very cutthroat, very tough, very mean, very somewhat opaque, heavy bidding game or auction game. Absolutely. And with the zero value roofs, essentially you lose your turn just because a random draw came out. Oh, I lose my turn. And that it's not, doesn't, it's, it doesn't, it's not a modern mechanic. That's a really good way of, of wording that and, and how that feels. It just doesn't, it feels old. And yeah, you know, it feels dated, for yeah. sure. So we'll just want to get that out of there okay. so everybody can have a turn kind of thing. And graphic design-wise, or I should say as far as artwork-wise goes, you're going a little bit more from like cityscape to like lakefront to kind of describe that a little bit? Um, so we are still holding it in the city. Um, the game board is going to have the same shape. And okay. Kind of a long rectangle. Right. You've got the three rows of buildings, uh, for those that are familiar with it. On the left side, you've got um, this like uh, skyscraper, big buildings. You got a big one-way street that's like five lanes or something like that. We're still working on the concept. Sure. With it yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we want to make sure that the players know where to place the mayor. Okay. Um, and then you've got the estates that you're building. Um, it's kind of like this construction zone, and then you got the river that separates this natural park area all the way on the right with a nice little lake at the very end. So as your eyes pan down this board, you go from real busy to like a construction site, then a beautiful nature preserve, and then a guy's hanging out on his boat in a lake. <laughs> it's, just like, nice. it makes awesome. the, it's just a really cool panoramic view. Which, so. all, and this always killed me with this game, much like the climbers, here it looks kind of like this, this child's game to where it's just building block <laughs> it, it, type stuff it and it's the same thing and here we uh, have always said it's the most brutal auction game ever created that right? is that is 100 percent true on that i agree with you on that yes so simply complex <laughs> but brutal but too really that, that that's the uh the the uh you know simply complex colon but really kind of brutal <laughs> Can we put that on there? <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so time frame on this, because I know folks are going to be really, really excited to finally, for those, because it's been hard to get. Yeah, it is. So this will be our Essen release. Um, we will have it available at Essen. Um, one of the things that we're doing to it is making it colorblind friendly. Okay. Um, and we were uh, reached out by our distributor partners and retailers that they love the climbers, but some customers are hesitant because of the colorblind issue. Uh, okay, and fair, that's fair happened, point. You know, I mean, yeah, it is a fair point. And it's like, okay, what can we do? I, I take this information, I'm not going to ignore it. You know, I want to apply that to our games. <laughs> Why wouldn't you, right? I, I mean, you're trying to sell copies of the game. Yeah. It just makes sense. So we're going to do some silk screen images around the floor cubes with different patterns for the different colors. So players that have that, that I don't colorblind know, yes. issue, right? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, can still play the game and know uh, what 
what color it truly is just based on the shape that's on the side of the cube. That way, because this game, when you play it, you know, you don't want to be asking, you know, hey, is, what is that one over there? I'm kind of looking at that floor cube. <laughs> then people kind of know like this, oh, he's, what, he's, he's going, going after the blue ones, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 right, so, sure, for sure. It's just stuff like that that I want to incorporate. And um, we, because of the production costs of this, um, we would have to do a print run that is substantially higher than we've ever done. So that means that leaves realistically one other option, which is, of course, yeah, Kickstarter. So exactly. This will be our very first Kickstarter. Um, and there's no way to, for, basically, if we didn't do Kickstarter, mm -hmm. we would throw all of our capital at it for this year um, and launch the game. It, it, basically print it to what I want it to look like. Okay. But the problem with that is, what if it's a miss? I've got all these copies. Yeah, there's still gonna be a market out there that want the original game, and they're gonna buy it. Sure. But, you know, that's only a, a fraction of this total print run size that I'm looking at doing. So, so it's an unnecessary risk for the company because uh, yeah. which, a poor business model if you put all your eggs in one basket and it goes under. I mean, you're, you do this I, You do done. this for a living now. You're yeah. full-time. Then so. there'd be no more Capstone games. Right, be which, done, which so. I imagine folks would be <laughs> upset about. I would be bummed because yeah. obviously you go back into our catalog, find games that we love and <laughs> make them available to the masses, which we appreciate. So, yeah. <laughs> so basically with the Kickstarter, I mean, we're looking at... Um, at using and, and I've been talking to, to distributors about it, and mm -hmm. they understand. Um, it's it's uh, w what I think is going to happen is with Kickstarter these days. It's amazing. Um, I think that it's a free marketing tool essentially. You know, you put something on Kickstarter, and everybody knows about it. They know all the information because it's listed on. Well, the good right. ones they're all listed on there, and you can reach out with comments, and it's just. It's transparency, pretty much. Okay, so, so so two questions on yeah. that that come to mind. First off, is this a new model for Capstone, or is this a one-off, or is this going to become the norm? This will not be the norm. I guarantee you that. Okay. So. Um, this I, I this is why Kickstarter is great, is because there's a project that I want to do, but it's so risky for me just to do it the traditional straight to retail method. Um, that hey, we got to really really hedge our bets here with 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 Kickstarter and that's that's the and, that, and, and that's yeah. exactly what Kickstarter is there for yeah. I, I imagine right and the second thing is you said this is an S and release and you're talking about Kickstarter which means right around the corner question mark absolutely um, we are nearing the completion date with um, the artwork and um, we actually got a guy working on the video right now for the Kickstarter so we're gonna have a 3d view of the game and how it plays and everything okay um, but the Kickstarter will release on April 11th it's a Wednesday and we're gonna run it for I think 23 days it'll end on May there's a the first Friday of May is when it should end so. okay and delivery then right around us in time this year yeah um, I've been working closely with the factory this will be done at Panda um, they do a phenomenal job. Their qualities, I mean, everybody knows their quality. Sure. So, um, again, top-notch components here. And um, it should be done around, uh, like, late August. So it will be available at Essen. But also, here at Gamma, um, we're talking with retailers to get them an idea of what we're doing. And a lot of them are really happy to, and pleased that while we are releasing this at Essen, we're still going to have a U.S. release at that same time so they can join the party. For so so it's yeah. not a after, after Yeah, they don't have to wait. Fact, oh, right. man, everybody's at Essen, and, and these games are so great. Yeah, I can't get it for another couple months. That's the worst feeling, especially for a retailer who's trying to capitalize on that. Sure. So we're going to be able to offer that to everybody at the same time. Cool. So. All right. Well, and, you know, that gives me plenty of time to do a playthrough video of uh, the estates as well. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> So we should have um, the prototype components are coming in, and um, we're basically what's going to happen is the Kickstarter is going to launch. Uh, we'll be following through with that for the, the time that it goes through, and then in May we have a couple weeks to gather all the information, understand what kind of print size we're going to do, and then go to the factory from there, and then it's uh, smooth sales hopefully to the. Uh, so actually, one other question then on the Kickstarter aspect is, I mean. Kickstarter backers at this point feel I almost feel are conditioned to expect stretch goals. Mm -hmm. So how is this going to be done? The stretch goals are essentially what I want to do with the game. There are some fun ones that I've that I'm okay because 
Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, to g basically, the what I want to do, the silkscreen images on mm -hmm. the side, that is the ultimate thing I want to do with this game. Just to okay. make it colorblind friendly, plus it looks great. Um, we have to hit a certain dollar threshold to make that happen. That's going to be the big stretch goal. There. Okay. All right. I've got, and if we hit that, and I and I hope we do, um, and if we go above and beyond that, then we're going to start talking some exclusives to Kickstarter backers. You know, there's there's some things that I've got. These are not rule breaking abilities because that's the thing that I've always mentioned with Kickstarter is when you start throwing in promo cards and hey, you get this extra character that does this, it completely derails the gaming experience. Okay, so you're not changing the core game no, then with any of you, these stretch goals when you, or anything. Yeah, and I hope we can get to that point where we, we release those stretch goals um, that are exclusive to Kickstarter um, because they're, they're going to be stuff that you're like, okay, I'm really glad I backed this Kickstarter because it, A, it's exclusive, but it just makes the game. So is it just cool little upgrade type stuff? More or less. I mean, you're hedging your bets here. You won't let it. Yeah, I'm trying to goad you into. I'm trying to try it out of you here, man. Yeah, it's it's some some things we're still working on. And but so it, it doesn't affect the gameplay. So if you don't back the Kickstarter and you end up getting I'll a give retail you version, I'll give you this. Majority of them will not affect the gameplay. There is one that I'm working with Klaus right now on something a little special for the okay. game. Okay. All right. And this would still be a Kickstarter exclusive. So, okay. Um, this one would be much after the fact, after all these other exclusive things that I've got lined okay. up for it. One last question then that comes to mind. You mentioned that retailers are going, this is going to release to the US and uh, Essen yeah. around almost identical time frame, yes, right? exactly. So you mentioned Kickstarter exclusive. Does that cut out the retailer or are you going to have a retailer pledge to where they can, so if people whoever out there doesn't like Kickstarter or doesn't or misses it or anything like that, they can still get the Kickstarter version of this game from their retailer, from the local yeah, we're game gonna store, have a retailer or whether pledge. it's you know, a, a game surplus, say, for instance? Yeah, so any retailer, um, we're gonna work through that. We're gonna have a retailer pledge on there. So okay. retailers can still get the Kickstarter exclusive. However, people that don't back the Kickstarter, um, and they they can either get it through the retailer right. or um, whatever the number of uh, Kickstarters that, that back this game are, is, and if we get to those exclusive goals, that's all we're gonna print for those, and we're not gonna do more than that. So later on, as if, you know, if, speaking if, hypothetically, if this game does really, really well, and we have to reprint it again, those exclusives will never be printed. Okay. There's no need to print those again. I mean, because of the price point that we're looking at doing the game is expensive, right. and then including these this free stuff is going to be increasing the cost of the game. Too. Okay, so, that makes sense. So, so help them. So the 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 public, the Kickstarter backers, are helping Capstone. So your way of replay, re returning that favor is to give them these exclusives. Okay, we did it together. Awesome. If we do it again, we got it off the ground. We're good, and we're just going to do the normal version going forward. Yeah, but without that extra right, stuff. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So gotcha. That's, cool. That's the goal. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. It's, it's nerve-wracking, but at the end of the day, um, the game will be made. It's just a matter of, is it going to be colorblind friendly? Uh, is it going to have this extra stuff that I want to put you know, in there? And, and it's only due to cost. It's not due yeah, it's to holding the carrot cost. out in front of people's no, faces. I, that's, that that's, type that's exactly. I, I don't want to do Kickstarter because my marketing and, and business background is not formulated for that. I mean, I'm, I'm straight to retail business. It's, that's how we've been doing business this entire time. And uh, and I, I think that channel has been working really well for us. It's just, hey, this is a little bit pricey for what we're looking at. So, okay, cool. Good yeah. deal. Awesome, man. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, even though I have my version of Neue Heime, I'm anxious <laughs> to check out the estates plus whatever little extra goodies you're giving us uh, for the Kickstarter. Yeah, so good it stuff. should be a good thing, and I'm excited for it. So. Cool. So uh, the date again was? April 11th. All right. So check out the estates, Capstone Games. So Neue Heimat 2.0, or second edition from Capstone. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Appreciate Thanks it, Ron. Appreciate All right. it. Cool. Connor McGooey from 
Inside Up Games. Uh, he and I sat down at Gamma to talk a little bit about his game that came out at Essen last year, Summit. Hey y'all, Edward here at Gamma 2018. Happy to be joined by a buddy of mine as well as designer and publisher. So Connor McGoy of Inside Up Games who published and designed the game Summit. Yeah. So, so how's Gamma been, dude? <laughs> Interesting. It's like unlike any convention I've done before. Yeah, um, same here. Yeah, but yeah, 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 it's true. I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm more used to like the constant hustle of the individual sales, right? Just going, going, going. And this is a lot more relaxed. It's nice. You actually have time to meet, discuss, network, and then bond, right? The people that you've met and don't have time with. Right. At all the other conferences, you can actually sit down and have a chat with. Right. And it's not all go, go, go. You can actually go out of the vendor hall, or I say vendor hall, but the trade show floor and go get some coffee and sit down and have a chat oh, for an hour. And that's totally normal. And that's fine. It's crazy. I, yesterday, I think, right before the hall opened, it was... 12 or whatever, my wife, and you got kicked out of the hall. So my wife and I went up to the room and had lunch at like noon during a convention day. And I was like, you, that never happens. Like, just don't get used to this, honey. Normally you're there like 8 a.m. <laughs> you come back at like midnight and you haven't eaten anything. So uh, I resemble that. I, I've been there, done that, et cetera, et cetera. So Gamma, yeah, this is definitely a, an odd duck, both from a uh, just the, the pace of everything, but also what it represents and what it is putting publishers and retailers, distributors, media, so on and so forth, all together and yeah. everything. So is this your first Gamma? Yes, it's our first Gamma. And it's true, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and it was like a mixed blessing in that Essen went really well for us and a couple of big deals went through, but which means we sold out of everything. So it was kind of awkward. <laughs> good, good problem to have, yeah. but now I would like to be able to give you some more to sell. But, exactly, right? Yeah. So it's like, oh, where can we get it? Well, Peach State has a couple left over, so you could try them if you're lucky, but if not, you gotta wait till May when all the uh, foreign language translations are done. Okay, all right. So Summit uh, came out uh, last year. Yeah, Gen Con last year was the official release, uh, about a month and a bit after the Kickstarter's fulfilled. Cool. And then the Yeti expansion released at Essen, as did Vault Assault. All right, so tell folks a little bit about Summit. Sure, yeah, so, so Summit is a game you can play competitively, cooperatively, or solo. So one to six players, two-sided board. Um, we were, really went all out with the manufacturing. So it's just, you know, two and a half millimeter thick tiles, six sheets of punch boards, two-piece uh, plastic custom insert. So like it's a, it's a game designed by a gamer who wants the nicest game you can have. I, I, I like the way you word that, very cool. And it's all about mountain climbing, yeah, right? Yeah, and it's funny because uh, uh, Brandon and Al and I will have this, had this conversation at Gen Con when he was talking about, you know, how to describe the game. And he would always call it either an outdoor adventure or a mountaineering game. And I'm like, no, 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 no. First and foremost, it's a survival game because this game is going to kick you in the junk for two hours. <laughs> so whether you're going to do that competitively or cooperatively, it's going to kick you. Okay. And so if you have someone walking by the booth and you say, you know, I got a mountaineering game, then you, like, it's not going to get their interest. But if you say I have a survival game, it's probably going to get their interest. And if you ask them, do you like competitive games or cooperative games or solo games? So that pretty much covers they, the entire game. They gamut. have to say yes, right? And then if, that, if that, none of that worked or they didn't hear you, they look over and they see the, the dual layer player mats. And in the, for the resource track and everything, and that they just rubberneck and they come right back to the booth. Cool, very cool. Nice. And we actually have a copy of this, and we're going to be reviewing it down the road. So yeah, looking forward excited. to that. Yeah. So I mean, it's sold out though. I yeah. Mean, yeah, it's super exciting. It's one of those things too when you have it until the deals go through, you're, you're pissing. Can I say pissing yourself? Sure. You're pissing yourself, right? Being like, oh, I got this stuff. You know, I'm, am I going to be the guy who's got games in his garage forever, right? And then it sells. Like, oh, I don't have anything, right? I need a bag of it. <laughs> right? Oh, crap. So, like, it's, you, you can never win. And then all, like, it was an expensive game to manufacture and to ship. It's six pounds. So, it's a heavy freaking oh, game I, to move around. Trust me, I know. So, thank you so much we we for giving that to us in Essen <laughs> uh, so that we could lug that home along with the other game. Yeah. To what? be fair, it was for Amanda. She's way cooler. Yeah, all right. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you said competitive versus cooperative. So there are games that claim to do both. So what 
sell me on it. So especially on the competitive aspect, because you know, co-op, not really our thing too much. Yeah, But exactly. as far as the competitive side of things. So the simple, the, the 10 second snippet to prove it is Ready, that. Ready, go. <laughs> Mad versus Meeple gave their stamp on the competitive. <gasps> Dice Tower gave their stamp on the cooperative. Right, so wow. if, you can get, if you can get recognition on each, either side of the game board, then you have to know that they work. Each of them work on their own, right? Okay, yeah. All right. I, uh, I suppose that's one way to look at it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. All right. Okay, if I'm going from Mass Market to Peel Hill, those are the things that sell. Okay. Unfortunately, you need, right. you need any sort of award. You need. You know what? There's there's a nice one with an elephant. It's a like, gold ribbon elephant. Tell me more. Really hard to get, however. So I, and like you know, there's reaching for the stars, but if that elephant sits on me, I'm not getting any stamp. Keep drinking milk. Exactly. All right. So but basically, yeah. So if you put in the cooperative side of the board, it's one. The boards are have, it's two sided, as I said. Right. But basically, you need to work together. It's like uh, Robinson Crusoe, right? Or, or Forbidden sure. Desert. Yeah, You're right. just getting kicked in the junk for two hours. Um, the nice thing about it that I like personally is that player elimination is a huge part of this game and it has to be. The theme and Which, the mechanics. That, that surprises me. Well, the stupidest mechanic in a cooperative game is someone loses, dies, the game's lost. If we were on a desert island and you died, I'd just eat you. <laughs> Right, it doesn't make any sense. On. Right, right. The, we're moving forbidden on. Forbidden desert, uh, forbidden island. Like one person drowns, so, she, so everyone just what, like rolls over. So that's driven me a little bit crazy. Uh, so in in uh, the cooperative summit, like the mountain kicks your ass, and if you're not losing, then you're not. You don't have the difficulty setting high enough. Like you're gonna lose, and if you still don't lose, put the yeti in there, and then you just, you'll never win. <laughs> So, I get, you get, so anyways, that's what I like about it is you literally have these f stories of like, you know, we're climbing the mountain together, you get a stomach bug, you're puking everywhere, you're dropping health, right? I end up like, twisting my ankle, I've my, then you get hit by an avalanche, right? It's just it, this funniness of like all the bad stuff that can happen to you on the mountain. So you end up sacrificing yourself, right? Matt comes along and he's like, you know what, take my food, take my oxygen, you guys go on, you know, go on without me, whatever it's going to be. So that's fun on its own. Then again, there's people who don't like cooperative games because they find them too soft. I don't know who, weirdos. Right. Bearded, totally. mohawked weirdos. Oh, 100%. Um, no, but anyway, so they don't like that. Basically, flip the board over and never have to play the cooperative side if you don't want. And it changes quite a bit. So instead of a time of day track and a Sherpa track, now you have a position track and a karma track. And that karma track is what really Karma's hooked us. me. It hooked me on this game. That Thank one you. aspect yeah. on it. It hasn't been done. And uh, it's the best mitigating factor to take that game. And people can complain that Summit's too mean okay and a competitive summit and the answer i'll give you for that is a i didn't make your friends play those cards right and b if you're actually a good gamer you realize that there's a 14 point spread on the karma track higher than any position track marker so if you're if you're smart you'll actually play the game nice not necessarily fast because whoever's in the lead is going to get the tall poppy gets cut Right? So whoever's gonna stick their head out, boom, they're done. So you follow along in his tracks nicely, you're feeding him some food and oxygen, let everybody else stab him which, or her in the back. Which, which that gives you good karma, Exactly. but then you cut their rope, you do all this stuff. You throw your skis at them. Right, Yeah. And your the, karma well, drops. And in great stories, I had one guy throw his snow goggles at someone else, and then because he didn't have his snow goggles, the next event card was he ended up getting exposure and losing his turn, just random stuff. But anyways, yeah, the karma track basically works that during the, the race, because I mean, races on their own are kind of boring. This one's great for two reasons, is the karma track, but also it's a mountain, so I'm like getting lapped, which you can't have feeling that you can do anything about. This one, I'm heading up the mountain, I piss you on the way up, piss you off on the way up, I come back down and you're there, right? How are you doing? And you've remembered. <laughs> Elephants have long memories. Yes, exactly. Never forget anything. And then, yes, and then the karma cards. Then you're playing cards to actively help or hurt your friend. So I'm giving you food. I'm giving you oxygen. I'm speeding you up. I'm giving you a warm blanket or some an extra whatever it's going to be. And then at the same time, you're realizing, oh, Connor's just refilled in camp. So you go, hey, Connor, you want some more food? And I'm, no, I clearly didn't want more food. But you're playing those nice cards without really being nice. So gamers get their teeth in it real quick and they figure out the, the best way to really screw each other over. So why why Summit? Like why, why a survival slash mountaineering game? So what was the appeal for that? So it's actually funny because uh, I've been told... <laughs> Okay, there you go. <laughs> Not that funny. That was okay, too funny. Sorry. Okay, my bad. I was more like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It was, uh, I've been told for years that I should make a game because I love board games, but I'm sure everybody's told that. Um, but I actually worked in construction for years and I ended up getting really sick and had an internal blood leak that they couldn't locate, blah, 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 taken off the job site. So uh, I had basically time, time and an idea to focus on a board game. And what was really important to me is I'm the guy in my family and group of friends who picks the game when someone comes over. And it's so important to me to pick a game that's gonna to appeal to the players, right? Like I don't want the players to morph to the game, I want the game to be picked for the players. 
Um, so when I was designing the game, I wanted to, to pick a game that you could literally pull out no matter who was coming. So if it's, did they want cooperative? Yeah. They want competitive? Yeah. Did no one show up? Well, I'll play solo. So whatever it's going to be, like this is a game that touches everything, right? So there's no reason this game wouldn't fit into your, into your gaming catalog. And I mean, some people, I mean, they'll complain it's too mean, so they don't play the mean side. Um, or they, the mountaineering aspect doesn't interest them. So again, as I mentioned before, that's why the survival part comes in. Because people, are you interested in being shipwrecked in Robinson Crusoe? Are you interested in right, these certain things? Not always. Are, are you interested in the 10, 20,000th train game? Maybe not. But there's something with maybe yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? So just like that kind of... so. You just need it's, to actually get the game. It's something different, and, and it's something unique. So it exactly. wasn't it wasn't something that you know you like to go mountaineering. You you know. But I also got lucky in that regard. So I have been I have been mountain climbing. I've you know used ropes and everything you need for okay. climbing. But like fun recreational warm weather stuff. Uh, however, I have two friends who are both Everest summiters. And oh, I picked, for real? Yeah, really? for real. Wow. For real. So okay. I picked their brain. Actually, if you look at the Kickstarter video, there's uh, photography at the start of it. So that's a buddy of mine, Bryce Brown, who's from my hometown. And he does a, he's at Everest a bunch of times. And he has gorgeous photography wow. from it. All right. So I picked his brain about you know some of the jargon, some of the items you'd use. And actually, one of the important things, too, is just being respectful of Sherpas, um, because it's both their religion, their last name, and their ethnicity, and just making sure that I wasn't doing anything that could be demeaning to them in any way. And that's how it should be. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So enjoy yourself. So, and it was actually funny, when he finally got around to playing the game, his character died of altitude sickness. <laughs> He's like, I've done this for real! <laughs> Yeah, so Good stuff. Yeah, so it goes really well. I mean, it's going really well, and the hype train slowly building, which is nice. We're getting a lot of more, you know, a lot of posit more positive reviews, and also like getting away from people's preconceived notions of like, oh, it's either just a race game or it's just a mountain climbing. Game well, game and game. I, I, when it, we and I touch base, we and I, really, when we and I, when there was you, three of us. There was. It was you, me, and, and me. I. Uh, when when we touch base in Essen, I was like, yeah, not really super keen on like co-op, co and you were like. You're an idiot. Yeah. There's a competitive like, side to this. If you want to be competitive, it's Here, hard. Here, take six pounds that you have to mail home. And an expansion. Pack. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, honestly, like, man versus people say it's harder to find a meaner game. Like, if you want to sit around and kill your friends, you can literally kill your friends. Hmm. All right. Um, disclaimer, Inside Up Games does not take any responsibility for any actual murders of players. Noted. All right. Cool. Thanks a lot, Connor. Thanks Appreciate for it, man. Thank All right. you so much. All right. We'll talk soon. All right, bye. Bye. Kevin Nesbitt of Mercury Games had the two copies in existence of the game with him there, and he was kind enough to sit down with me for a few minutes and, and talk about the container. So enjoy. Hey, y'all. Edward from Heavy Cardboard here at Gamma 2018. The convention has actually just ended, and I was fortunate enough to be joined by a buddy of mine, Kevin Nesbitt of Mercury Games. And as you guys can see, we have the ginormous edition, the 10th anniversary edition of Container. So, Kevin, thanks for taking the time, because I know everyone's tearing stuff down out there. No trouble. You grabbed me by the collar and you dragged me in here. I don't think I have much of a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Says the guy who's 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> so, so, everybody obviously can see the the supersized version of Container. Yeah, uh, yeah. Here. This in particular is the, uh, like a little engineering sample I brought. So, this is the final product, mm -hmm. but it's unpainted. It's, it's to show off the kind of the cool resin, right. the solid, heavy. It's a quarter pounder. It's a quarter pounder unloaded. I, I think once you put the uh, the containers on there, it's going to go up, you know, 10, 20 percent from that. But yeah, a quarter pounder. And sure. we were fortunate enough uh, before the actual show started. So on Tuesday night, the three of us, you, me, and Matt, got together, went up to your room, and actually got a chance to unpack it and take some pictures. Yeah. And take a look at it. And I got to say, it's not as obnoxious as I feared that it was going to be. <laughs> we got right? a lot of questions about that. Sure, um, People sure. are afraid we're going to sell something silly. And I mean, so it, I mean, it basically started with the containers, right? So we wanted to, we, we took the original container size, felt they're a little, a little small, a little fiddly. Uh, they fall off the boat so easily. They, they're hard to load from a distance. Uh, um, and, and, and work with what, what, what's, what size makes them manageable? What's, what, how easy is it to pick these up from across the table and load them onto the boat? We kind of joked about if the price is right at the warehouse, someone will load them for you. But if it's 
if it's a if it's a too much of a steal, they'll make you load it themselves. So you're reaching exactly, across the right. table and you're loading them up. So so once we got to a size where the containers were comfortable and mm -hmm. with, with a high degree of accuracy, you could pick them up. Um, that set the size uh, for the containers. But of course, then that dictates the size for the boats, and that dictates the size of the harbors, which dictates the size of the player board, so on and so forth, all the, all the way up to the box. So it's kind of that one little measurement took us all the way up to. So it actually went backwards from what I assumed. I assumed, you know what, let's make these huge ships and then go from there. But it was all about the containers is where it started. Basically, yes. I mean, I mean, in my mind, of course, I imagine gigantic ships and, you know, magnets and levitate. But, you know, being realistic and being the, sure. being the publisher, no, the, the, the logical way for us to start was with the containers. Because that's what you're interacting with the most. And mm -hmm. then the ship's the second most. So, so one set the size for the next. But it went from smallest up to, you know, the biggest things. That makes sense. Yeah. And I got to say, graphic design, it looked really good. The colors are clear, crystal clear as far as delineation as opposed to the first edition right. that definitely had issues between the ship color, the container color, so on and so forth. Yeah, it's nice to have colorblind um, protection there for people. And and we have access to some nice filters. And I mean, it passed all the tests except for the you know the, 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 the folks that have trouble seeing anything but black and white. And of course, it's going to be very hard to make a game for those folks. Sure, I understand that's sure. quite rare. But for everybody else, it passed all the filters. And, and instantly, the colors are still easy to recognize yeah, for most people. Yeah, they're, they're, they're clearly delineated as opposed to that first edition to where there were shades of brown. Right? right, that was that was really hard, especially in a darkened room. I mean, it's, 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 it was workable, but it could, it could be better. And I mean, uh, any reprint has got to be, it's, it's about learning and, and doing better. And so we've had 10 years to learn and do better. You're right. Yeah. Um, so us being here at Gamma, and this is on the cusp of being delivered, correct? Right, I mean, we had that um, that delay with, uh, we had that the material change that we didn't know about. So we, I mean, this is the boat we approved. Right. And ultimately the boat we got was something very different. And so they were saying, where do you want these delivered? And I said, well, I don't want these delivered at all. I mean, if they can't be top quality, I don't want any part of lower quality. So send them all back. So I think something like 30,000 of these were put to a to oh. a, a some some poor use of garbage or something like that. Wow. And um, but I mean that's that's what it takes to I mean so here we are months later. Right. And now it's done right. And that's that's more important to me personally and to the company to get it right, even if it takes a little while longer. Ultimately, a few months delay on the front end, no one's gonna remember that. It's right. whether in whereas if these were brittle like say the first edition ships right. were, people yeah. would remember that. But the fact that, I mean, yeah, that's, you know what a, I mean? I mean ship. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Um, you drop that in your toe and you'll know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Again, quarter pound. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I, this, this, it, yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> I would advise trying that on me, but you could try it on somebody, maybe. <laughs> Says um. the guy dragged in here by the collar. Um, so as far as timeline, when are folks looking for both Kickstarter uh, fulfillment as well as retail. Well, we're expecting this to be ready to send out in mid mid to late May, no later than early June. I mean, there's you know things could still happen, right? Sure. You know, logistics being what it is. Right. I, um, I play a lot of those games. I understand. Right. Yeah. This game, right. for example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so um, late May, early June for for, for pre-order Kickstarter uh, folks. They they always go out first. I, I I don't know if I mentioned before. Um, we have this thing. It's a policy I've had since I've. St I mean, I started publishing a long time ago now, um, but I've always felt it's important that you're the, the, the last person to get your own pre-ordered copy. So, I, I mean, obviously, I don't... You know, being Mercury Games, Mercury, right? Well, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a Mercury Games policy. It's been a personal policy my entire publishing career, and it's a Mercury Games policy company-wide. Uh, while I have a demo copy to bring around and, and, and give away or show, uh, I don't get my own copy um, until uh, everybody else's pre-order copy has shipped first. Uh, so it's possible, conceivable, if someone, say, in Honduras has ordered, it's conceivable I'll be taking my, and opening my copy before they receive it. But right. generally speaking, people are, I'm seeing pictures of people enjoying their copy before I ever even get mine. And I think it's... That's a, pretty cool. I, I think, think that's a fair a incentive. Policy. Yeah, it, may, it makes us work harder and efficiently, because, of course, we want our own, we're drooling, we want, we want this too. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason we're printing it. I want a copy too. Um, and uh, I, think that, I think that's a, a, fair, a fair deal to have with your pre-order customers, right? Like, they're trusting us with their money, right? Right. Uh, and so you, you you owe them a you owe them a, a debt, and part of that debt is making sure their 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 copy is on the way before I get mine, right? So, so. and when you say pre-order, you mean pre-orders through the Mercury Games site as well as Kickstarter, right? That's correct. Yeah, in this case, we did a we did a pre-order for the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. did a Kickstarter. There's still a late pre-order, um, which is going to be ending soon um, on our website. Um, so yeah, all those folks I would consider pre-order customers, backers. They're all people that have trusted us with their money. So you know, the highest priority to them. Very cool. Yeah. And for
for those that didn't pre-order or are watching this after the fact or missed that on the Kickstarter, et cetera, et cetera, this is going to be available retail? It'll go to retail, yeah. Um, um, there's minimum order quantities, and especially when working with this kind of material, which is very expensive, you have to have a, a, a pretty healthy minimum to make it make any sense at all. As far as like the print run, you're saying, yeah, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's really expensive. Per unit, these are quite expensive to make. Uh, by far the most expensive game I've been involved in. More than double the most expensive game I've ever produced in my, oh, wow. my career. Okay. More all than right. double. But again, I... I can believe it. Yeah, it's just, right. it, you work I mean, with that kind of material, it gets expensive. Um, and the, the logistics of shipping a heavy box, yeah, like six it, pounds? It, yeah. I, I think it's nine, nine, nine and a half, something like that. It, it's heavy, yeah, it's heavy. You wouldn't, again, don't drop on your toe. It's <laughs> not going to work out well. Uh, so, sorry, what was your question? So, as far as uh, retail and making this right. available to those that may have missed out on the pre order. So, it should be on retail shelves probably mid to late June, all things being equal. Sure. No, no big surprises, uh, logistically speaking. Um, we have been saying, though, um, because you know our priority was was getting our pre-order customers satisfied, right. the retail is going to be a bit short supplied at this point. I've had a lot of questions from people uh, at this show, a surprising amount of attention. Um, we knew it would be popular. We didn't think it'd be this popular. Good problem to have. Good problem to have. Um, but what it does mean is that um, if someone really wants to copy this game and they're not in the pre-order, um, we still value any anybody who buys the game. That's great. The best thing they do would be go to their favorite retailer and say, "I want a copy of the container, uh, and would you please reserve one for me." Um, that is the best way to avoid like a short supply situation. Okay. I'd like to All think right. that everyone who wanted a copy can get one, but the reality of publishing is sometimes we have to guess uh, a number ahead of time, and the number we guess ultimately does not meet the demand, and there's this gap between right. you know, the printings. So on, I'm asking you to look into the future potentially. Hmm. With the cost that this game was, the size, the shipping weight, the whole nine yards, is this a one and done as far as the 10th anniversary edition of Container, meaning this might be the only print run because of costs, or is this something that could happen again? Um, it, well, it is, it is very expensive. Um, we've had good support on our pre-orders. Um, like I would like to think if we, if we have the short supply, we think we do, that we would reprint it. I, I've, I've not, in my publishing career, never liked telling people, it's in super short supply, you've got to get it now. Sure, it, I, right, I don't like, yeah. I don't artificially. Like, right, right, I don't like yeah. people do that to me as a customer. I, right. play, I buy board games too, um, so I don't like doing it to people. I genuinely think it's in short supply, um, but if it did sell through like we think it will, we would have a lot of incentive to run this same edition again. There will okay. be no, there will be no regular edition, with no plans at this point for like a regular non-cool like edition. A, a smaller version. Yeah, or... it doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose to go backwards. We we pulled some of our customers, and we found that no, they they want they want the more deluxe. It, it's it's not like it's a brand new game. It's a known game. People love it. There's a there's I think there's more fans of it than there were copies ever printed, <laughs> which means there's I I think that's a fair statement. Right. Sure. And so so there's no there's no incentive um, for them or us to to take it down below this. So I mean the tenth anniversary tradition I would expect would have a reprint at some point. I mean, okay. it's expensive and it's time consuming, so I can't say how big the gap would be. Okay. Um, and I don't want to create an artificial panic no. at all. That's not my, not my goal Understood. here, but just for, you know, for fair play right. for people, if they want a copy, they would be best served to go and get it reserved now, however they choose to do so. Okay, cool. Yeah. And don't want to keep you too long because I know you got to, but you did just make the announcement about the 20th anniversary of Big City, right? Right. I mean, we, we've had some very good fortune. I mean, I worked with uh, some this title before in its previous iteration, um, so it gave me a good connection to access the, the, the rights to that game as well. Uh, we've been fortunate to be offered that. It's a great, great success for, uh, for such a little company. Uh, yeah, Big City is a game that I think it was the very first Euro game I ever bought. Um, I think in 2000. So a sentimental ties. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even then, then as now, I still think it's a really cool game. And just by, I mean, by sheer coincidence, um, Franz Benno, the designer, uh, I, I had spoken with him before his untimely passing in 2007, and he right. had told me exactly what he would do if he could change the game. Because he, he had some things with the original game he didn't like ultimately. Okay. Um, and so some buildings he would like to have added, some he didn't care for the exchange rule ultimately, how the, how the properties are traded. And while he didn't always provide the exact answer I have enough email I kept all my emails with him um, and I still have them and that's so here very, we are that's 10 really years, cool it's like 10 years later and I can still almost like he almost ask him what would you what would you do what, what remind me what would you do if you had the chance to reprint this game it's kind of like he, it's kind of like he's involved in some way right, right. it makes me feel good uh, because it's kind of like there's some input there that I can work with and we have we spent a lot of time developing it it's it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be even better and I think that his widow would would be excited to hear that and be and appreciate 
hearing that, right? I would, I would like to think so. I mean, I mean, um, I think they were excited that we were interested, um, and um, and I think it's I think it's uh, there's there's a legacy there. He was a very very smart man, a very good designer. Um, with I think Big City was one of his proudest titles, and so the so I think that yeah, I think there's a sense of pride and and, and happiness there that's uh, that says like th these games uh, are are timeless, right? So here we are, you know, 20 years later. And it's still a pretty cool game, and right? It still so, holds up, right? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, yeah. All right. So, container fulfillment May retail June ish, yeah, maybe give something or take a like weeks that. Either way, yeah. As far as big city, how's that working? Uh, big city, well, so that was actually ready for Kickstarter, and it, it again, it's so expensive. It's, it's a jumbo edition. It's gonna have. About thirty-three percent large. I mean, this is not not this large. Okay. Um, but All I mean, right. the largest for those for those people that watch that know um, big city. There's like there's grids and there's like a right. one by one yep. property. There's sure. a one by three. The one by three property is coming in around you know let's call it five inches, five and a half inches. Okay. So it's it's, it's still a great. It's still I mean, a, a, a eye catcher on right, the table. Right. right. But because okay. there's no containers that need to be upsized, that which dictates the rest of the project, we don't have the same upsizing issues. So it's gonna okay. be it's gonna be great and healthy healthy upsizing, but not not so much healthy. Makes 30, sense. 3%, whereas this is about 50%. Okay. So still big and cool. And time frame? Uh, so the, the we don't run, as a policy, we don't run Kickstarters. It's, the Kickstarters been ready to go for a couple months. We, we won't run a Kickstarter when there's a product pending. So if someone's given us their money and waiting for a product, we won't ask them to pay us more money and wait for a second product. That's just not a, a they, we just that don't seem, do it, right? That seems like the right way to it's do not, it. It's not, I wouldn't be interested as a customer in doing that, so I'm not going to ask our customers to do the same Fair thing. Fair enough. So that, that Kickstarter should run sometime probably late June it'll start. It'll okay. be about a 30 day. Well, it'll be abbreviated because we want to get the project moving, but in the background we've already started working. We believe there there's a market for these cool games with cool pieces, especially big city. And so some of those buildings are in design stage right now, like they're they're, they're being presented to the factory, ready to go. So, so you can hit the ground running when the Kickstarter goes, right. you do have a pretty Definitive timeline on when to expect things. I'd like and to. I'd like to think we'd even have something final to show by the time the Kickstarter is going. Whether oh. it, whether it's a building or two, whether it's some like some, more than just flat artwork. I'd like to have sure. something we could actually show. Okay. Uh, which is which is unusual for a Kickstarter, but in this case, it's 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 important to have the timeline preserved because the end ready date we're hoping for October November of this year. Okay. So that's that's that's, that's abbreviated. So we got to have our ducks in a row. And I but I, I'd like to think we can do it, especially now that we know how to work with this new resin and. We're happy with the results here. We can just use what we learned and apply that to big city as well. And now you do, you basically not knocked out all the kinks, so I to speak. Sure, I mean, the, in publishing, there's no guarantees, fair as enough, you probably fair know. But I say all, but in theory, there's always gremlins, right? There's always you got unforeseen it. things. You got it. And so, yeah, so we're excited, especially that there's new content in the new edition, um, which is going to be kind of fun to work with. Um, again, with a lot of input from the original designer, which is just brilliant. That's amazing. Uh, so lucky. We're so fortunate. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would like I would like to hope before the end of the year we'll see this thing uh, you know published and available, which would be just just spectacular. Awesome, man. Yeah. So yeah, container and big city. Be sure to check them out from Mercury Games, Kevin. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Safe travels home. And Absolutely. You too. Hopefully, uh, we'll run into each other again. I would certainly hope so. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks, Thanks very a much. lot. Thanks, y'all. Two of the funniest people that I have met within this board game industry are the guys behind Board and Dice, the Polish publisher that did Beer Empire and a host of other smaller games. Well, they have Blight Chronicles coming out, which is a solo campaign game that sounds pretty interesting. And one of the guys, Philip, sat down with me and talked a little bit about it. Hey, y'all. Hi, all <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Edward here at Gamma 2018. Happy to be joined by a friend of mine, Philip Glavach. Yeah, perfect. Uh, uh, Board and Dice, the Polish publisher. Yeah. And we're here to talk Blight Chronicles here a little bit. Be yeah. Before we get all into right. that... How was Gamma? Is this your first yes, Gamma? Yes, this is our first time here at Gamma. So we will just like try to find what is happening, how to like, how to be a publisher at Gamma, what to do, where to see, who to talk to it, and like sneaking around and ask our friends like when I see when I saw you I oh some friendly faces you and know? I thought the exact same thing because it's my first gamma as well and so we actually ran into each other on yeah. Monday yeah at the you know like I was just going to get my badge and everything and I was like oh yay friendly yeah. face okay that's so <laughs> so nice so I can I'm not all really, here. right exactly but now that you so now that we're here essentially at the end yeah what do you think so 
we can say for sure that this is our big success right okay, now. Okay, good, yeah. awesome. We, we, like, our expectation was broke right now, so we are above those. We didn't expect so much, so so many co uh, contacts we, we met, so many people that we couldn't met or like talk uh, through emails, mm -hmm. because like most of them are just uh, in the dark of email and spam and so on. Sure. So if you are a small publisher from Europe, you need to be on such events to like touch yeah. other FaceTime. Yes, yeah, yeah, like yeah. handshakes and so on. Uh, sure. This is how you do a business. You need to you, you need to show that you are a person, mm -hmm. you, you you care. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I think that pretty much nailed it because as much as here we are in the 21st century yeah. and everything, it's still very much a people business. Yes. Yes, yes, it's uh, it's when we met those people it's also like those big distributors mm -hmm. then you meet those people and they are hey hello like can we just uh, um, get a drink and you know, drink beer and talk and it's, it's suddenly it's not like it's not big it's it, those are people and all, those are very passionate about new games and people here are looking for new games even you, if you are small but you have something interest they will looking for something like that. So you, you, you don't have to have a big hit. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it could be like these small under the radar games yeah, that yeah. something different, something yeah. unique. Oh, those clients didn't uh, see this game a lot. Maybe it is my opportunity to bring this game to US and show everyone. That makes sense, yeah. all right. So speaking of new, you got the Blight Chronicles coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so after uh, Super Hot the card game, after Page Quest, we saw that people really love to play solo games. Mm -hmm. So we pre we are preparing a very big, like I think the biggest solo game of all time. Uh, <laughs> That's that's a that's a that's a big statement. Yeah, right. I, I can make this statement because I know what is included in the box. Like this will be a big box, a lot of content inside. It is around two hundred cards inside. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quest book inside, stage cards inside. Because you will be participating in one big story. You are an you are an agent. And you are like walking around and suddenly you have a call from agency. Okay. And now you jump into the action. Oh. And during the action, you, you need to think about, do I, do I go that way or that way? And then maybe, all right, I will go that I, I will jump through the window. Mm -hmm. Then I died because I wasn't prepared to deal with things that will happening next. So I okay. will go back and maybe I will go that way, but I'm, I've, I know what is on that side. So maybe I will prepare myself and go that side rather than uh, like discover new things. But this path brings me something different. And this path also brings me something different. What's more, when I choose this path, this, this path influence that stuff. Huh. So it's almost like a, a living world in that yes. your decisions will affect other aspects of the world that exactly, exactly. the game takes you place You have in. only one information that you need to save a doctor okay, because he has the knowledge to prepare the mass uh, destroy weapon. Okay, all right. So you don't know where he is. You will discover this information during... Uh, during your way, okay. Maybe, maybe you will discover something that will brings your doubts. Okay. Doubts about yeah, yeah, right. about the mission, and so on. Like, you never know. Depends on which path you take. Okay. So uh, replayability. Then, how does that get affected? Like, how does how do how are you able to play this game more than once? Then. So, be, first of all, you will you will you will want to see other paths. Okay. Because each path brings you new enemies, new targets, and targets to go from one stage to another to another are completely different. Okay. And you will want to see, okay, I 
I, I, I finished the game, but mostly you will die during. <laughs> so, so, okay, so let me stop you there. So when you die, what happens? How does the game, re does it completely reset or does it go back like a video game ask to where it goes back to a save point or? Yeah, you will have a sa save point because you are going from one stage to, a, to another. So the first stage, then you choose uh, A, B or uh, a A or A B. Okay. Then if you die, you can like go back to last stage. Gotcha. Okay. All and right. yeah, yeah. Start again the stage you you where you died. Yeah, but okay. but maybe you will try to move at the beginning because you know that this not just was one mistake. You you made some few mistakes on the way, right. but now you know how to prepare yourself. Because uh, when, you, when you want to go to the other stage, you can stay a little bit longer on that stage you are, because okay, okay you are ready to go to the next stage, but maybe you want to sneak Explore around. Explore a little bit yeah, more. To and... get to get some stuff, but sometimes you will not have time and time will play against you, but and you go anyway, and then you say, ah, I shouldn't stay there a little bit longer and take this item and go, go further. But in the same moment, if you stay too long in one stage, you will gain suspicion. Okay. So if... Well, you did mention sneaking around, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, right. so you gain suspicions, you gain a visibility, and every time those two trackers go up and up, so some more people are thinking, oh, that that guy didn't belong here. Like, we should focus more on that guy. And depends on which stage you are, people, uh, the, uh, um, the your enemies that okay. are on during that stage react differently. Based on your visibility level, yes, so on and, and so forth. And based okay. on the... Uh, the idea of the stage. Okay. So the, we, we are not uh, putting like giving you a lot of the same. Okay. During uh, during um, progressing okay. of the game, we want to give you um, enemies that react differently. So for example, at the beginning, you have cards that trigger some actions when they came up in the line, but then there there will be cards that uh, trigger some actions when they are killed or when they are pass, okay. very different things will show up. Okay. And this also depends on where you go. So for example... So the path you take yeah. then, so, right? For example, you enter the game and you say, oh, I'm like, I'm super, su super awesome in this game. Then you go next path and then realize that, oh, I didn't have that thing when I played last time. Okay. And you failed. And then, oh. I didn't expect. So it keeps you keeps you humble then. Yes, and, yes. Okay, because right. so uh, as you, as you see, so depends on on your decisions. Different things will be, you will be dealing with different things. Okay. All right. So how how long would a session go or a game? How uh, like game length? From one to two hours. Okay. All right. And time frame as far as what are we looking at this coming out? So uh, this game will be on Kickstarter net next month. Okay. So April. Yes. Okay. Late. Late April. April. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it this game will be huge as as a game mm -hmm. for uh, our solo. Okay. So a lot of cool mechanism inside and a lot of story because as I mentioned, there will be a quest book. So when you progress the stages you will read the story, what you did, right. and how it affects why you're here, and what will happen. So you, this will be like reading a good uh, action book. Okay, so but it's it's very much where you're the main player and almost yeah. the choose your own adventure kind of aspect to it. Yeah, and and you will be addictive of, of playing this again. But try and different and ma making different decisions yeah, because to see. Always when you end stage, you will have go the, this way or go that way. Okay. So as you can see, I go that way. Hmm, hmm, I go that way. Sure. Right. 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 Okay. All right. So April Kickstarter. 
ETA yes. for delivery, you th you're thinking? This year. Okay, so like Essen or after Essen? Before Essen. Before Essen. That's yes. ambitious. With yeah, because next we, are, month. we are wo working on that game for a long time. Okay. This game is based on Asian Decker. Okay. So a well-known solo game and people was waiting for something uh, bigger than Asian Decker. Mm -hmm. And this game have big community behind. And when we are speaking, we was reading about what they want from Asian Decker, what they will change in Asian Decker. Mm -hmm. We take all those information. All the feedback, right, yeah, right. And put the action, put, put inside the story. So people will be, this will be like great book. Okay. Full right. of action. Cool. I'm looking forward to checking it out. So, yeah. Phil? Thank you for uh, giving me a chance to uh, talk about yeah, this Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked to check it out. I'm getting more and more into solo games. So, yeah, that, that should be Yeah, and like surprisingly, this uh, this part of, uh, of the hobby, it's of growing. The hobby is growing. Mm -hmm. Page Quest, we didn't expect people want to play a solo game that will be delivering to them month by month. Each episode, right, right, in episodic type, yeah. Yeah, 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 and it it is still print and play game, so they need to play this. But thanks to to the mechanics of uh, page that are like you have whole game on one whole episode on mm -hmm. one page. Very cool. Very cool. People people want to spend their time not only reading the book, not only watching TV alone, but playing alone as yep, well. Yeah, pretty much. Cool. All right, Philip, thanks a lot, man. Thank you. I'll see you uh, at Essen, I yeah. guess. Right? Hope you understand anything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> you did fine, man. Good stuff. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Artana had a booth and Jess Davis was running the booth. And so I grabbed her right at the end of the convention as she was tearing everything down and said, hey, do you have 10 minutes? Can we go talk about Einstein Genius in the upcoming dice drafting game you guys have? And she said, yes. So here you go. Hey, y'all. Edward from Heavy Cardboard. Happy to be joined by Jess Davis of Artana. And Gamma 2018 is over. It's done. It's a wrap. Oh, goodness. Put it to bed. Yes. Done. Put myself to bed. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Or just drink more coffee. That more coffee. Right. Always coffee. All right. So, uh, so you're here as a representative of Artana. Yes. Uh, have you been to Gamma before? No, this is my first Gamma. Every single person I've talked to so far that I've done interviews with really? has been. This is all of our first time. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, so what was your experience now that it's over and like? It tell, was great. Yeah. Tell folks what like. Yeah, I mean, it's really great to meet the retailers, um, talk to the uh, local gaming stores, people who are really going to be bringing the community together, seeing what they're looking for, what they need. Um, so, yeah, it was an absolutely great experience meeting with the distributors, people we work with regularly. And then it's just like, you know, our traveling con family. That is such a good way to put it because <laughs> there's so many of us that are on the circuit at yes. this point, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, hey, I'll see you in a couple months at Origins, or I'll see you at UK. I'm sad when whatever. it's a couple months, because usually it's like, okay, I'll see you in two weeks, there's the next con, the next con, um, but sometimes we have a little break, and that's that's kind of a withdrawal. I always wanted to run away with the circus, and this is just the circus with board games. Wow, see, I, I welcome <laughs> the occasional break, because it's a lot no. of travel, right? No, you don't board know. games. But yeah, but... <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> All right, so we're here to talk Einstein uh, because yes. the Genius expansion just dropped. Right? Yes, it just hit retail yesterday because yesterday was Pi Day. Right. Yes. That makes sense. So Einstein's Genius expansion um, that takes um, this this game is twenty to thirty minutes. New players up and running in five. Um, super great filler game. Right, which you told me when we talked at BGG Con, yeah. you were like Einstein, not for you. Not your game. But, Einstein with the Genius expansion, yes. now it becomes heavy cardboard, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Or the heavier, heavy cardboard realm, I should say, right? Absolutely. As far as yeah, it does. And that the whole point of um, this game, Einstein's game, was to bring non-gamers into the hobby. Okay. Um, so 
you know, I'm also on social media as a board game girl, and I get constantly the question of, how do I get my girlfriend to play games with me? How do okay. I get them to be a board gamer? Or, or boyfriend, or as boyfriend, it were. Or boyfriend, right? or whoever, mom, sister, cousin, however right. it is. How do I get this non-gamer? This so, guinea pig. Mm -hmm. No, right, yeah, 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 yeah. I got how you. do I right, get them right. to play with me? So, um, <laughs> the guinea pig too. A llama, <laughs> it could be a llama. I could don't be. know, no, whoever that's, it is, cats. That, we're not talking do they have opposable thumbs? Because okay. they do need those, but as long as that So happens, Asher can't play this. Okay, no, no, sorry, Asher. Okay, all right, okay. So. They're asking how we do that, and that was the point of this game, okay. was to bring in um, the non-gamers into the hobby while still creating a filler game that's going to be great for gamers as well, because we're gamers too. And we right, and you don't want something that's going to put you to sleep, no. that I would rather do anything other than play that game, right? right? Okay, exactly. Sure. So it's for us as well, but it's, but it's also to reach out to those uh, non-gamers and bring them in, because this hobby is growing phenomenally. Mm -hmm. So um, this game, they're up and running in five minutes, they're placing tiles, um, they're fulfilling inspiration cards, kind of like laying the tiles in a tanagram type design, um, getting points, sharing points if they use tiles that are placed by another player, so mm -hmm. it doesn't feel take that -y or like you can't make a move because you can always build up. Um, and they've got that down, they play that 20 minutes, then they're going to want to play again. Um, for your for your heavy gamers, you're going to play it as like beginning of game night, waiting right, for everybody the, to arrive. Or winding down at the end, right? Or in between if you have two game groups going and you're waiting for somebody to finish, that type of thing. So it's a great filler because of the 20 minutes, right? Okay. Um, and still abstract fun. But now with the Genius expansion, it takes that 20 minute game and makes it a 45 to 60 minute super thinky game. Okay. Um, you're going to have strategy, you have your major theories are replaced with a whole end game scoring tableau. Um, so you're going for the most chemistry cards, the most mathematics, physics, um, and then you're scoring by majority for those. Uh, it also opens up a mechanic where you can lay in another person's tiles, because um, they're all color-coded to your version of Einstein. Right. Um, but you can lay another person's tiles, and you might do that because if you're going for all the chemistry cards, if they don't have chemistry tiles, they can't complete the chemistry cards. Makes sense. So it allows you to maybe level up in that. Um, it also gives you some cards that you can take into your hand. So instead of having to worry about, oh, that major theory is available right now, like it is in the base game, but somebody else could take it, now you can know you can build up because you have that ability to take that into your hand and then plan for it. Okay. Um, so that's the change to the game. And I've played it with, I play with heavy gamers, I am a heavy gamer, um, and we play this, and it's it's super thinky, um, and, and we have a lot of fun so with it. it basically incorporates a lot more long-term planning, mm -hmm. a lot more depth of planning. Absolutely. Cool. Good yeah. stuff. So you said it just hit retail? Yesterday. Pi right. Day. Right. Awesome. All right. <laughs> so the, you have one other game that's coming out, the yes. Dice Drafting. Which, yes. when you said Dice, so I looked at it and I was, and you were like, I don't know. And then you said Dice Drafting and yeah. my ears kind of perked up. I was like, hmm, por qué? Yeah. So, so yeah, tell us about it. Um, so this game is Speakeasy Blues. It funded on Kickstarter in November, and it is by Daryl Andrews and um, Adrian, Adrian Adamescu, um, and they both designed Sagrada. So you know these guys know dice, um, and it is a dice drafting action selection game. Um, so it's not random, you're not chasing the dice. This is, you're rolling the die, you're placing them for your actions um, from a dice drafting pool. Um, if you get stuck, if there's really an action that you want to take and it's blocked off, you can pay a dollar to go ahead there's and refresh. There's a way to mitigate, right. Yeah, and it's okay. all thematic, it's in the rules, it talks about the fact that if you had this speakeasy and you had trouble getting your hooch down from Canada or there was like a leak in the bathroom, it would cost you some money to fix. So Makes it's all sense. thematic. Theme always bleeds through our Tana games because um, I'm all about the theme. I love the story. So um, then you're building a tableau, and your tableau is actually a speakeasy. Um, your player board, it has the speakeasy bar in the background. You're taking cards in for set collection. Um, you have mobsters that'll give you some really great um, actions that you can take. Rule breaker type stuff? Yes, but then they cost you a little bit too, and the cost is in prestige, and you're going for the most prestigious speakeasy. 
But if somebody sees a mobster in your speakeasy, that might affect the prestige of your um, establishment. So there's a negative there while giving you that benefit. Okay. But you have the ability to cover. So when you're building that tableau, you can take another card, cover. So once you've gotten what you need maybe out of that action, you can go ahead and cover Kind of distance yourself from the mobsters say, ah, then at no that point. no more, we're done. I'm going to break that uh, right. arrangement. Right. Um, so there's that as I gotta, well. I got to wash my hair. I'll talk to exactly. you later. Right. Yeah, 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 right. That. Gotcha. you got the Fitzgeralds in there. So you're getting some prestigious historical characters from the time. Oh, very cool. Amelia Earhart. You know, so all of our history is in there, the pictures of these people, as uh, Artana Games always does, um, for set collection in that regard and to give you prestige. Um, and then, of course, you're going to want some yachts and maybe some cars when they see you driving around in those. Obviously. Um, they're going to want to come hang out with you. All right. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> so I guess that's it. We need that's to go it. to MeepleCon. Yeah, we do. All right. So Vegas. we'll see you all in Vegas. Vegas, baby. Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> all right. So seriously, Jess, thanks a lot for joining him. And let's go have a drink and head that. to MeepleCon. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Take care, everybody. It's pretty funny. Tom and I talk about how he and I talk a lot amongst ourselves at various conventions, but we never actually sit down and actually record anything together. So I was like, okay, that's got to stop. Let's go ahead and record a little something at least. So Tom and I sat down and kind of talked shop a little bit, and you guys get to listen in on that. So enjoy, y'all. All right, here it is Sunday at MeepleCon 2018 here in Vegas. It's the end of a very long week and sitting down with uh, somebody who I run into fairly regularly on the con circuit, but you and I don't talk a whole lot, at least not publicly or whatever. So That's Tom, true. <laughs> Tom Vassell so, uh, of the Dice Tower. So hey, what's up, Tom? Yeah, Good, good. I'm having a good time. And you're right, we don't talk like on air much. No, we really don't. I mean, we interact privately like whenever we see each other at conventions. In those secret backroom deals yeah, that... Obviously, right? Right? <laughs> so we both uh, just attended Gamma Trade Show uh, up yeah. in Reno. Um, so what do you think of it? Obviously this is not your first Gamma. This was my first Gamma. What do you think of the show and, and what do you get out of it in general? Yeah, Gamma, I really like the show, but I'm always glad to leave too, if that makes sense. Because Gamma is a work trade show. So you go there and you make deals and, and there's a lot of retailers there talking to publishers. There's publishers talking to distributors. There's retailers talking to distributors. And then there's people like us trying to butt our noses in around and talk to everybody. <laughs> Sounds about right. A lot of announcements are made there. And although nowadays the announcements are almost simultaneously made on the internet or not. So it's not as, like they had a press conference there that wasn't really that big of a deal because they made these yeah, yeah. announcements elsewhere. Uh, and I like it, and it's good, but if you're a gamer, you should never be jealous that you're not there. Yo, 100%. It's strictly a, it's networking and, and business. Yeah, like even like you're like, oh, I want to see my favorite designers. They're kind of there, but they're so busy doing business. There's not even that much gaming that happens there. They do a little bit of gaming on a couple nights, but like on the nights that they don't have scheduled gaming, you don't see people cracking open games. It's really weird to me. And so I was really glad to come here to get the gaming out of my system. For sure. So Gamma trade show, industry trade show, MeepleCon, I actually, this wasn't on my schedule. I had uh, Steph and Jess and a few other people were like, you should come to MeepleCon, change your flight. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I came down here and they said, I think it's the fourth year of MeepleCon here in Vegas. Yeah, would you do it again? Yeah, I think so. I really like the combo, that work of seeing business and uh, then playing and game, games. Uh, right, yeah, and then, and then coming here and actually being able to sit around. And it's in, uh, at the Eastside Cannery, which is a uh, locals casino here in Vegas. And it's in a big convention hall. It's, it's almost like a scaled down room of the main room at BGG Con or something like that. Right, for, for me, it, this is very similar to our second year of Dice Tower Con. Okay. It has the almost same feel to it. It's really loose. I mean, it's there's vendors and you can go browse and talk to them in the library. It's so easy. There's 
very few scheduled events. You just kind of get around and play games. But people here are willing to play pretty much anything, I'm finding. Yeah, I've seen, I mean, they've had a uh, big game of Axis and Allies 1940 that's been going all weekend. I've seen everything from Mazul to the Gallerist to Rolling Stock and everything in between. So are you busting out some uh, Zolkin? Early yeah, I played weekend? my two heavy Euro games of the weekend. Well, heavier was Zulkin and Lahav. Uh, Nothing wrong. I, Both excellent games. So they, that's cool. Yeah, and I'm I'm coming around in Zulkin. I played the expansion, really enjoyed it. So that was fun. And then I played a whole bunch of prototype play, not prototype, but play test games and stuff. And found some decent ones. I played a little card game, Tiber, something something from Alexander Fister. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. it was one I picked up. I don't even know if it's going to be widely available because it's Mayfair. And so, Fair enough, right. And but it was a nice little card game where you can, like, it was almost like um, halfway to glory to Rome. Not, not, not quite there, but where you're using the cards for different things. Okay, so multi-use cards. Et Fister's cetera, a really good designer, I he, think. I, 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 and he's a really nice guy to boot. Uh, Most designers are, actually. Most, I didn't say all. Hey, fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, no, a uh, fan of uh, Alexander's as well. Um, so what's next for you, other than, I, I assume, flying home to Florida from here, right? Yeah, I'm flying home to spend some time with my family, um, just working. The, April's usually the least busy month of the year. I'm going to a, a small gathering of friends. but And then in May is also very minor. We'll go to CMON, but at the end of May, then the crush starts. We go to UK Games Expo, Origins, Gen, Dice Tower Con, Gen Con. Those four cons in a row, it's just, it's, they're, they're fun to go to, but it's brutal. I can relate. I don't have anything until HeavyCon, which is Memorial Day weekend, then UK Games Expo, then we go to Sweden. Straight from that, we go to Origins, and then back home until Gen Con. I think we may be going to WBC. You're going from Sweden, you said, to Origins? Yeah. Is uh, there a con was, in Sweden? Yeah, well, no. Uh, so UK Games Expo, and then from there, we had a... Uh, we have a twice a year, we do a thing to where it's called Heavy Cardboard Game Day around the world. For all our patrons, we draw names at random and wherever they are in the world, we go bring our game day to them. And there's a, a guy, Space Monkey, who won the first drawing. He's in Sweden. And we were actually going to go around LyriaCon a couple weeks ago. However, he was like, ooh, February, March, probably not the time you want to come to Sweden. And he said, and I said, what about around UK Games Expo? He said, that's an ideal time, so that's what we're going to do. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty fun. It's exciting for us to get to travel to some you know, places that we wouldn't have a reason to go to otherwise. And we get to meet uh, some listeners and, uh, and viewers of the show. So it's a pretty good gig, although it's right in the middle of a pretty heavy gauntlet of uh, That's true, because you're going to do that, then come back and go to Origins. At least Origins is pretty laid back, right? For some. <laughs> Remember, I do the, the streaming there. Oh, so it's, it's yes. not laid back for me at all, actually. Right, fair enough. Fair Origins enough. is my busiest. Origins is my tie for my. The three busiest cons are Origins, Gen Con, and Essen. Gen Con and Essen just because they're that intensive with that many people. Of course. But Origins because right. of the work. Oh, okay. Fair enough. That's right. You guys have a booth there. And UK you Games Expo is my more laid back one. I really like that one. Okay. This will be my first year going to it. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be sitting down uh, interviewing Francis Tresham while I'm there. So oh, that's, wow. That's a big get. I mean, that's kind of a, that's, you, a, that's a big deal. You see they just reprinted Civ. Yep, and that's what, that's exactly why he's going to the UK Games Expo. And I got a, a buddy of mine, Richard Klein, who is setting that up for me. He's apparently friends with Francis. And he's getting up there. I think he's upper 80s, early 90s. So I feel like it's kind of important to be able to sit down with, I mean, the father of Civ. And the father of 18xx. I mean, the man invented the tech tree, right? So, yeah, that's true. So kind of a kind of a big deal. So cool, man. So we ought to we ought to talk more. We ought to, <laughs> you know what I would like? Not to put you on the. He's spot. fishing to come on a dice tower. No, uh, yeah, that, I, I I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, hey, you never know. You never know. Uh, you know, I never say no. Always be willing to listen, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't plan on it. That said. Would you be willing to sit down for a uh, long-form interview, kind of talk about your history as far, not now, but down the road we could Skype? Yeah, sure, that's not a problem. Yeah. I actually just researched my history, so I know what it is. Uh, <laughs> and talk about how, uh, how Dice Tower came to be the, uh, the massive entity that it is for... Oh, it's for, not so big, but yes, it's fun. Oh, well, for the hobby, I think, it's, I think it's pretty cool what you do, because even though you and I are pretty, pretty different in what our audience is 
I can still appreciate what it is that you do, both for yourself as well as for the hobby. The fact that you bring in a lot of people to this hobby, which is important for people They then like graduate me. to your show. I wouldn't say graduate. No, no, listen, this happens a lot. Sometimes we, we talk and people say they watch Wheaton, right? They watch Tabletop. Right. Then they watch the Dice Tower. And then they kind of sometimes are like, oh, okay, I'm going to look more into miniature games. So they go that way. Or they then get a heavier Euro games and they go this way. That happens. Yo, that, that's a sure. natural progression. It doesn't happen with everybody. Some people stay where they're at. Yep. And some people bounce. They'll play CCGs for a couple years, then they'll play RPGs, and it's, it's interesting to watch. It is, and no, and so in that regard, I think what you do is both important and commendable, because let's face it, it's impressive what you've built, man. I, I can well, definitely... Uh, I'll let other people say that. That's, yeah, whatever, but still, I mean... I'll say I never expected to be where we're at now, for sure. That I will completely... I bet buy. you never expected to be where you're at. When, when you we almost started, did it on a lark. Right? Kind of. You were like, I, I have no job, so I'll do this for a while. No, 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 no. How it started was I got tired. So I used to listen, you know, to you guys, Seeker Cabal, and, you know, all the other show, all the other podcasts, uh, you know, four or five years ago. And none of you guys talk about the games that we played. And I was like, what's the deal with this? How come nobody talks about these boring, dry, horrible looking games that I really, really enjoy? And I was like, well, if you're going to complain about a problem, I was always taught, you know, offer up a solution, and I made a solution. Started a podcast, and three and a half years later, now I'm fortunate enough to be, you know, on a smaller scale than what you do, but doing it full time and, and providing, a, I think, a valuable service to the to the board gaming community. I think you and I both both do that just in different ways in different audiences, but I both think there's a lot of value in what we both do. Well, it is a good life lesson for those listening. I mean, really, it, like you just said. You sit around and you're like, I wish this happened. Then do it. I wish there was a convention for this. Then make one. You know, do what you want or don't complain. Those are your <laughs> options, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, you know, and so sometimes I've been like, oh, I wish there was a show like this. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. You know, it's fun. And so. It really is. It's a lot of work. You know that. But it's also a lot of fun. All we do all day is play games. <laughs> it's work. Oh, it, it, it absolutely is. But you know what? There's something to be said for what it is, doing something you're passionate about, doing something you love, doing it with friends, and being fortunate enough to have that luxury to do it, right? Indeed. So, cool. Tom, I appreciate the time. I know uh, you guys are flying out here not too long. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. I get that. I totally get that. Plus, Vegas, baby, it gets tiring after a while. So, Tom, thanks a lot. Take care. And I guess, uh, I guess I'll see you at the UK Game Tech Show. All right. See you then. All right, did you play anything else other than those things? Yeah, so the mind, obviously, a yeah, lot. Yeah. Uh, Toby, so Toby has done the online implementation. He's created it for Rolling Stock and the new edition of Rolling Stock that's going to be coming out from All Aboard Games. Mm-hmm. We, I didn't really feel like sitting down to a, playing a full game yeah. o- of it, but my one attempt at playing this game was really not a good experience no it was it was quite awful actually and i was like okay you're the resident expert of this game and you're a huge you know evangelist for Mm -hmm. rolling stock said okay sell me on the game why and we set it up and he kind of ran me through it and when i was originally told about the game i was told that it's a stock investing game and that's very much not what it is it's all about an embezzling and milking your companies for the most value and very, very, very mathy, which the mathy part doesn't bother me at all. I like 18xx <laughs> games, but uh, the way he described it, now I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty stoked to give it a try. Okay. So I'm looking forward to playing this at HeavyCon well, with more folks. Were we either playing it wrong the first time, or was it were we just not really used to them? Or as Toby described it, and this is not exactly going to you know make the game sh- jump off the shelves. I realize he says, yeah, your first five ten games, you're you're pretty much not really a hundred percent understanding what it is mm. that you're doing. So very opaque. Okay. Um, Along the lines of a, a 4X type, both in theme as well as in, as far as just, it's not very clear what it is that you're trying to do. And sometimes if you're a dollar short, you're just out of the game. So it's just, a PAX game. <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's a unique beast. And apparently the second edition is taking some, it's making it less sharp edges and, okay. and making it a little bit more approachable. Mm. 
And Toby said that some of the really hardcore Rolling Stock players that he plays with, they really didn't like the second edition of it at Mm. all. But as they play it more, they're actually warming up to it quite a bit. So that's encouraging Mm -hmm. to hear and to hear that it's going to be more approachable. I'm I'm excited. And with Scott Peterson coming to HeavyCon, hopefully he'll bring a copy of it and be able to check out the second edition. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Because all I remember is just a very bad taste in my mouth from the last time. I think we just we all just quit. I don't think we even finished it. Yeah, it it wasn't a good experience. But the other thing that Toby suggested is. Try and play with experienced players so that they can kind of explain why you want to do certain things. And that will definitely help. And with Andy Mesa coming. I think we should have plenty of people. (laughs) And Scott Peterson, who's publishing the game. He said, I would I would try and get into a game with the both of them, okay. get your teeth kicked in and re- and see how the game can play. Sounds good to me. So I was like, OK, that uh, sign me up. Yeah, I'm in yeah, for that. Yeah, for sure. And then obviously the K-list that I talked about earlier, but Dominant Species hit the table. So Steph wanted to play Dominant Species mm-hmm. and I was all for a six player game. She was not having that. She was like, nope, I'm not going to play. It's going to take way too long. I said it'd take two and a half, three hours, and she didn't believe me. So we ended up playing a four-player game with two brand-new players and me and Steph. Steph was crushing us three-quarters of the way through the game. Hashtag bad teacher. That's normally how it goes. It's dominant species. It It happens. Uh, that said, uh, two hours, 38 minutes for a four player game with two of them new. Just nice. saying. So that was, that was, uh, that went really, really well, had a lot of fun and, uh, and yeah, just, it, it's nice to always get a, a, one of my favorites to the oh, table yeah, that sure. doesn't hit the table a whole lot. So that was, that was a good time. This was actually the first time that I played the first edition of Dominant oh, Species. Oh, really? So playing with the, um, prototype ish yeah. artwork on it. Gotta say, not a fan. No. Not a fan of the artwork. But you know what? It's functional, so I don't yeah. care. The game played just fine. Good. But I missed my little meeple, you know, our little uh, <laughs> Safari Limited minis that uh-huh. we have for that. So, yeah, yeah. Come at me. I like my little plastic dolls, all right, yeah. when it comes to the dominant species. It's really cool, and it adds so much to it. And there's elephants for the mammals. Thank I mean, you, on. and monkeys. So, Yeah. Uh, MeepleCon, definitely a enjoyable trip. Got a chance to go play poker at the Bellagio, which is some of my old stomping grounds mm-hmm. from when I used to play cards for a living. While I was there, I was able to meet up with a couple of the vloggers that I have the utmost respect for, for the quality of their vlogs. I've mentioned them, I think it was last episode, or maybe it was it was sometime recently. Uh, Andrew Nimi. And Brad Owen, I would recommend checking. If you guys dig poker at all, I would definitely recommend checking those two out and over on their uh, on YouTube. And honestly, if you are someone that is either like maybe wanting to start vlogging or wanting to um, kind of see really cool editing techniques and stuff, check out Andrew Nimi's vlogs. Even if you don't like poker, just the way he films and the way he edits is really incredible and really cool to watch. Yeah, it's I, I'm jealous, uh, and I, I am too. And I appreciate uh, just the quality of his work. and And both the guys were really gracious in meeting me. And it's kind of funny. Andrew just posted his vlog from this weekend, and he got his teeth kicked in at the poker table, much like me. Yeah. Um, played really well, got it in good, and and didn't hold uh, much like how my weekend mm-hmm. went. Uh, but that said, he was even so even having not having a uh, good run at the tables. It was a, he, both of you know he and Brad were both very gracious, and it was really cool to meet a couple of folks that I wouldn't say I look up to necessarily, but I appreciate the quality of their work. Yeah. So I appreciate excellence in life, and yes. these two guys do excellent work. And so it was cool to meet uh, a couple of folks that that kind of do what I used to do, but also kind of do what I do now, yeah. just in a different world. The crossover so, type yeah, thing. Yeah, it, it was pretty cool to see. Good. And and Brad's taller than I expected. He's like 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, oh six, like, so. Just keep looking up. Like, I know, oh, I'm not used to that. No, I mean, you're I'm not. Six two, yeah, you know? you're not. It's usually, <laughs> you're usually eye to eye with people. Right? Except for me, you know, I come up to like your elbow. So yeah, overall, a highly successful trip. 
uh, from a networking and just business side of heavy mm-hmm. cardboard, uh, but also a very enjoyable trip, even though I didn't get my awesome cheesecake from the Luxor, uh, unfortunately. And I found out Lotus Siam. Apparently it burnt down, the original one. So they moved, and now it's on uh, Flamingo. So it's closer to the Strip, actually. So nice. That's kind of nice and nicer building. Oh, on that note, let me tell you about this. So it was late one night and was going to go grab something to eat. And Jess and I were, were like, the, the East Side Cannery, not exactly the most hopping <laughs> casino in Vegas. So we were like, yeah, let's go grab something to eat. So we were going to go uh, walk four-tenths of a mile to this place, uh, Aces and Ales, which apparently is a, it's a cool little locals hangout. Okay. So we asked the security guard, like, yeah, can we walk there? He says, I'm not going to say you're going to die, <laughs> but you might not make it. Oh, my gosh. Uber, please. Yeah, no kidding. Um, wow. So we, we arrive at Aces and Ales, and it's it's after midnight, right? It's like 1230 or so, mm-hmm. and the door is locked. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this place is open 24-7 or at least open till like 4 in the morning or something. And then there's a little sign. Look up to – ring the bell, look up into the camera. Holy crap. So ring the bell, look up, wave, and you hear a buzz, lets us in. And I was, was like – Was there another door? No, just okay. I was like, wow, nice neighborhood. Like a bank. So we walk in, we're talking to the bartender, and he's like, yeah, not not the not the type of neighborhood you want to be walking in at night. And I was like, okay, noted. All right, we'll wait inside for the Uber to come oh, back. Holy crap. Yeah, so that was uh I was like, ah, so east side of Vegas. Stay away from there. But okay, that must be noted. where where CSI always goes. <laughs> uh yeah. So that was uh that was Vegas in a nutshell. Um, ate at Noodles at the Bellagio, mm. which is a a kind of a standard fare for yeah. when we used to live there. Um, just had a really low key time at MeepleCon and really enjoyable. And looking forward to going back next year. And Gamma was everything that Clay told me it was going to be. It ended up totally being that Good. and totally worth it. Uh, just from a business side of things, and and I'm really glad that I went. I think it's going to pay dividends down the road for both us here, you know, as hosts, mm-hmm. but also for y'all listeners Definitely. and especially viewers over on the YouTube mm-hmm. side of things. I think uh, a lot of good things are going to come of that, and a lot of reason to be excited because it gives us more opportunities to do more things. So. If that helps us, it's going to end up helping y'all. Yep. Everyone drives home in the Cadillac. That's right. So, yeah. All right. So, that that's pretty much that. All right? Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for listening, y'all. And we'll catch y'all next week back onto the normal schedule because we don't do have anything going on outside of up until HeavyCon, which then, is more, the end of May. Then things get crazy. But Yeah. So, HeavyCon. A day and a half later, I leave for the UK Games Expo. Going to interview Francis Tresham while I'm there. I'm going to be hosting a live podcast recording with Paul Grogan, Creaking Shelves, as well as Tom from Slicker Drips from the UK Games Expo. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Then from there, I fly straight to Sweden. And I meet you in Sweden. To meet uh, Space Monkey yeah. and the, the Swedish, Swedish contingent yes. of the herd. Uh, they won, or he won the heavy cardboard game day around the world Mm -hmm. then straight from that i fly to columbus ohio for origins i fly home with a uh, what i'm going to only imagine is going to be a suitcase full of dirty clothes (laughs) probably and then after (laughs) origins then i'll be coming home so it's going to be a insane schedule uh at the end of may but between now and the end of may y'all it's just regular episodes and a whole lot of content coming y'all's way So thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you all next week. Bye, everybody. 